Good evening, and welcome to the meeting of the Norfolk Board of Selectmen. It is Tuesday, January 7th at approximately 7.05 p.m. My name is Kevin Calcutt, and I'm joined by my fellow board members, Chris Weeder and Cece Van Tyne. We're also joined by our town administrator, Blythe Robinson, and executive assistant, Judy, Judith Lazardi. As a reminder, this meeting is being audio and video recorded, consistent with the open meeting laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It will be rebroadcasted to NCTV's government cable channel, as well as uploaded to NCTV's YouTube channel. With that, please uh, very slowly join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right, we have a nice agenda tonight. Blythe, would you mind taking us through? Of course, thank you. So our first, after public comment, our action items include um, discussing again this, at this meeting adopt, uh, whether or not the board wants to adopt the Attorney General's regulations on allowing remote participation at public meetings, to consider appointing members uh, to a anniversary parade committee for the 150th, to consider opening the warrant for the annual town meeting, which will be May 12th of this year. Um. To consider granting permission to the Garden Club of Norfolk to use the tower, uh, Town Hill and Bandstand for their annual plant and bake sale in May. To consider uh, appointing a delegate to cast Norfolk's vote in the Maya's annual insurance meeting later this month. To consider signing an agreement with the Car uh, Caritas property, um, that's the former Southwood Hospital, for a, a pilot agreement on payment of taxes. And to, uh, we're going to pass over the um, amendment to the HOD school agreement with the MSBA. We um, staff jumped on this when we got it yesterday and determined that there are some issues with the um, numbers in the agreement and we're revisiting that with the state so we're putting that off until we've gotten that resolved with them for discussion items we would like to discuss continue discussing the parameters for the FY 21 operating budget and then we have um, about seven warrants to sign and approval of uh, a set of minutes from December very good thank you very much uh, so our first item this evening is going to be our public comment period. Uh, typically during this time, we invite anybody who's attending to come up and join the board for roughly three minutes to speak on any issue you'd like, with the understanding that we are unable to dialogue with you on it since it's not part of our normal agenda. But you could leave it as a follow-up item either for our town administrator or for the board to consider at a later date. Uh, one note, I know there's some particular interest in a couple of presentations going on this evening. So if you have any perspective or feedback to give on those presentations, Please come up during this time as there's not going to be a public comment period after the presentations since there's no action being taken on these items this evening. So with that, would anybody like to join us for a public comment this not tonight? Jonathan Smith, please. Welcome, sir. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing a little better than you are tonight. Most people are. <laughs> Basically, I'm here to uh, invite you guys as well as everyone in the town to our town government you can study speak com up just a little bit for the folks in the back thank you to our town government study committee uh, forum which will be at the Norfolk library meeting room on the 15th at 7 p.m. we'll be just uh, asking for town input on some issues that we have been talking about within our group and they include such things as recall term limits the relationship between the town administrator and the board and any other issues that might come up uh, with our group and with people that might be there we've had forums before we haven't had great attendance <laughs> but we keep trying we're going to have a meeting tomorrow night where we're going to coordinate how we're going to handle the meeting on the 15th. But we invite everyone to please come if you have some issues regarding how town government is operating or how things are going. Please come. Thank you. Very good. 
good. Thank you. Anybody else this evening? Sir. Good evening. My name's Tom Ballone. Uh, I live at 62 Wildwood, the village of River's Edge. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is I have give you some qualifications. I have uh, I was a senior budget analyst. I've been a senior financial analyst and a contracts attorney for 35 years. Um, I want to thank you for your service in the community because I know sometimes it's a uh, a thankless job because I was on the board at the Village of River's Edge, and I can understand that, so thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to talk about taxes, which I'm sure nobody else wants to talk about um, since we just got our tax bill. In the last two years, our taxes have gone up about 25%, which for a retiree uh, living on Social Security is kind of a difficult thing to swallow. Uh, prior to that, we shopped at Whole Foods. Now we shop at Half Foods. Um, I know the one way to reduce taxes in this town is commercial property, commercial buildings, stores, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's kind of a long-term issue. Um, can't do that like that. So you got to think of something that's a little bit faster to do. And I have several suggestions. My first suggestion is zero-based budgeting. For those of you that don't know what zero-based budgeting is, the definition is a method of budgeting in which all expenses must be justified for each new period. Every function in an organization is analyzed for its needs and costs. And this, em this eliminates bloating of costs that budget to budget does not address. So basically it's what you and I do when you have certain income coming in and you have to budget. And you budget your actuals, your electrical, your gas, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Don't live without, with, you have to live within that budget. Just don't say I have a budget next year I'm gonna add 6% and the next year I'm gonna add 6% because it doesn't get rid of the bloating that could be in the budget already. When I worked at Children's Hospital, we used to do it budget to budget. Then the state came after us and said, oh, by the way, no more. We're not going to give you 6% over what you spent. We're, you're going to have to zero-base budget. And costs went way down when people actually peeled back the onion. And that's what we have to do in this town is peel back the onion. Uh, okay. So a better approach could be uh, looking at the purchasing and contract functions. Um, things that you do is you establish, establish processes of control and monitoring, you establish competitive bidding throughout this, doc, this area. You, uh, we, we know we need better contract control based upon the fact that we went over the police budget by $3 million. I've been a contracts attorney for 35 years. That never happened to me. Um, you establish master agreements with companies that you do a lot of business with. You do multi-year agreements so you can maintain and not increase by inflation. You kill it right where it is, and you do it for two or three years. You establish qualified vendor lists, so you're working with people that you know that have been qualified. And I know... And I know doing this would be difficult. Uh, and some very difficult decisions would have to be made based upon the fact that you're changing the way you do business. But from what I, am, from what I can see, we have to change. Because other than that, people with fixed incomes, people with low-income families that have lots of kids can't afford major tax increases. So we have to control them. We have to, these are methods that you can do in the short term. Um, and the thing I like to say the most about this situation, I went to the town meeting, the last town meeting, as you probably know, the little guy that kept on going up to the uh, podium. But the thing that you have to do is the people in this town can't just go to a town meeting and say yay to everything. I mean, you have a voice, and if you have a problem, then you say no, and then you can control costs. Um, the last time I was there, I heard free cash. 
Take it out of free cash here. Take it out of free cash there. Well, if there's so much free cash, then our, we maybe could reduce our taxes. Um, and I don't understand where free tax is, but that's not my thing. Um, Mr. So Villain, if you could just get no, to the that's end. pretty much, you know, I wanted to make it for like three minutes, and I did the best I could <laughs> to fit it under that. But I think, I think changes have to be made. Tough decisions have to be made. The old way of doing business should not be doing business that way any longer because we have to con get control of the situation. And as far as I'm concerned, we're not in control. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alex. Ernie Alex, also known sometimes as the Sage of North Street. <laughs> I just want to follow up on, uh, I agree 100% what the last gentleman said. I've run multi, multi million dollar jobs all my life. We are in a state that you cannot do what he said. We are run by the file sub bidder law. We are one of only two states. Nevada still has it. I'm not sure they still have it. Which means that file sub bidders on any contract, they bid two weeks before the general contractor. They could be the worst bums around. They are the file sub bidder. The general contractor might have had a lot of problems with him. He still has to take them. The law in this state reads as a file sub bidder and a general contractor, at the end of a project, usually the clerk of the works or the head of the building committee, has to fill out a report card, single sheet of paper, for the general contractor. If the general contractor gets less than a 70 on that form, he cannot bid on any more contracts in the state of Massachusetts. But he can also take the person that filled out the form personally to court. He can own the person's house. I learned that on two jobs. We're sitting in one of them that I, as the inspector on the job and on the permanent building committee, had failed that general contractor for doing shoddy work. I would be sitting homeless somewhere in San Francisco. Sit off on that. What I mainly came to is every state, every town is fighting the opium problem. This town is taking steps the other way. I recently went down to the fire department to get rid of some prescriptions that were old and not to be used anymore and found out that the depository for the prescriptions has been moved over the river and through the woods and up to the new police station. I'm fortunate I can still get around. But you take a lot of people that don't have transportation going to do it the old-fashioned way. Throw it in the backyard or flush it or the grandkids get a hold of it. Now just one more point of information. Uh, you were talking about putting some solar panels on Lincoln Street. That plot uh, that everybody would know as Yucca's Junkyard. If you grew up as a teenager around here, you spent most of your life there. The property behind it was owned by Jim Martin, who was in partnership with Bai Ingraham, who were two stalwarts of this town. The property is still owned by the Martin family. But there is a legal right-of-way going through the center of that junkyard to that piece of land. Also bordering that land, there is at least one cemetery 
possibly two. The one has been used as nearby as time-wise as two years ago. The state uses it for a popper's field. So that by, down by that piece of land that uh, is uh, landlocked, there's no telling how the boundaries are down through there. So do a little checking before you go in. My arms are getting short. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell how old the person is if the candles cost more than the cake on the birthday cake. <laughs> on the uh, permanent building committee, a couple of questions have been asked. Why don't we have one? Why don't we? We had a pretty good one. We had a minimum of 80 years of experience on it. Every time it turned around to try to do something, one of the committees would throw something underneath. Committees back then were fighting with each other, including this, which none of you were on the board back then, Selectman. Selectman's famous sentence was when we brought to him that something was going wrong, it's good enough, and we paid it. I did two depositions for this town. I won both of them, made their lawyers look bad, and the select board threw me under the bus and went ahead and paid the money anyway, which we would have won it, but they didn't want to have a lawsuit. So that's why you don't get people to come on these committees. It's enough for tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else this evening? Sir. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tony Centauri. I live at 118 Gray Birch. And uh, I am a recent re uh, new resident for the town of Norfolk. I moved here in October from Medfield. And I've been very happy with the condo that I bought. I'm happy with the River's Edge community. And um, in generally the town of Norfolk. However, in the matter of real estate taxes, I've got a problem, and it's been echoed by my, my friends from River's Edge. When I bought my condo, I knew and accepted the real estate taxes paid by the previous owner. However, I had a rude awakening when I was told that my assessed value and the tax rate were going to increase dramatically. As a result, I'm not a happy camper. What caused uh, me additional concern was the reported uh, story that the town was planning to arbitrarily raise the town budgets by two and a half percent. And to me, this is a non-starter. I know some members of the committee are espousing a zero-based budgeting approach uh, in preparing town budgets, which I heartily support. Uh, department heads should be able to evaluate budgets, uh, trim excess, and work towards a zero percent change, or even maybe a one or two percent reduction. Also, staffing levels budget should be compared with other towns of similar population. I hope the town will undertake this effort, particularly keeping in mind those senior citizens in town who live on a fixed income like me. And I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name's Marty McNulty. I too live at River's Edge and I'm thrilled about the 30% increase in my taxes. Okay? And I'm less thrilled about the maintenance of the roads, the potholes. The only thing we get from this town is good drivable roads. We're not getting that. N another point, can on the next budget, can they out can they point out the financing costs for the mortgages? for the projects they have going on so we can separate it, so we can see it on a single line. Because we don't want it folded in to the cost of this or the cost of that. Just break it out so we can see it. And the last point, 40B. We all want 40B. But I'd also like to see 40B assessed the same way our houses are assessed. The people in this town should be made aware that 40B doesn't bring the same income 
because their assessed values are much lower than yours because they're assessed on the purchase price. And when we're looking to put more, 70 more 40Bs in here, take that in consideration of how your taxes are going to be spent to support those families. Thank you very much. Have a nice night. Thank you. In the back, sir. Welcome. Welcome. Hi. How you doing? My name is uh, Jack Oliveri. I live on Barrel Place uh, off of Old Mill Road. And I wanted to talk for a minute about um, open space. In particular, I am an amateur astronomer. And I think I sent the members of the board uh, an email about this. And I got a response from the Recreation Commission indicating that um, there were some uh, possibilities for that in town. So I'd just like to review um, from an amateur astronomer point of view where the best fields are and what, what some of the problems are that I have. Um, in order to look at uh, the sky and the stars, you need as dark a, a, a sky or a, an area as possible. That's number one. That means you can't have a lot of street lights, you can't have a lot of cars going by, um, and you also need uh, a good horizon. In other words, no trees in the way, right? Um, that's especially true when you're looking at uh, meteor showers. It has to be very dark. Usually it's after 10 p.m. at night, and you only see five or six um, an hour. And they happen more often than you think. There's probably eight to ten times a year that there are meteor showers that occur that you can see them and photograph them and look at them. Now, in the past, I've had to go up to Vermont to get really dark skies. But there are some areas in town that people have looked at and proposed. I looked at the Freeman School, and the problem with that, I gave that a 7 out of 10, 6 to 7 out of 10. Why? Because the parking lot lights, as you know, are blazing all the time. Uh, if you look at the soccer field, you go way over to the edge. They're not as big a deal, but then you don't have the horizon you need because the trees are in back here. So that's not an ideal spot by any means. Um, Stony Brook. They don't have the horizon there at Stony Brook, and they have this uh, giant um, uh, light um, in, in the yard, and it looks like this. they leave some of the buildings lit up too at night, so that's not a really good uh, place. Um, the Recreation Commission and Proto recommended um, the Pond Street Complex, so I went over there, and the street lights are minimum, but the the major problem I see with that, I gave that a 7 out of 10 because the car lights coming up and down the road at night are pretty bright and they keep flashing on the property. I mean, it's got good visibility, but it isn't going to work. Unless you go there maybe at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, maybe you wouldn't have as much traffic. Uh, you probably wouldn't have as much traffic, but that, that's an issue. There are a couple of minus uh, traffic lights there. What you could do there, I guess, is put some high bushes or vegetation there maybe 10 to 15 feet high that could block out the traffic uh, lights from, from cars. Um, originally, the landfill was, a, was supposed to be designated as a, an astronomy area, and then the solar panels came in, and they grew up, uh, you know, they, they multiplied like rabbits, and there's, there's solar panels everywhere on the landfill now. And that was, that was nice because it had a hill where it was capped, and there was a good horizon, and it was pretty dark. Um, there were some lights there from the DPW, but uh, uh, they were they were not not too bad. And they could have been blo uh, blot blotted out. The other place I looked at was the Lynn Farm area, uh, right next to Lynn Farm, which I guess Norfolk owns, the Conservation Commission owns, is a flying field, and I tried to use that because it had relatively good horizon for the for the planes, the model planes that are going in, and it's pretty damn dark at night. Um, the problem with that is I get this big iron gate across it, and I can't get my telescope in there, and it's locked. And I went to the, um, um, the Rentham Development Association. Um, apparently, it's co-owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the um, Rentham Development Association. And they said, no, we're not letting you in, because they were afraid their flying field would get messed up. Uh, it's a telescope. It's got wheels. You just wheel it in there, and, and you wheel it out. With a big gate there, you can't get it in. You know, unless you get a pair of binoculars and you sneak, sneak by the gate, maybe you can do it. So um, in conclusion, I'd like some consideration to be given to any new land we get around the Pond Street complex 
or maybe some um, consideration for turning off lights in certain areas of these uh, fields that I talked about, maybe after 10 o'clock. Uh, do we need, you know, these lights turned on all night long from, from dusk until dawn? Can we save some money by shutting off some of the lights and making it dark? Um, you know, the, the prison is another big issue. They used to have these big orange sodium lamps, and I could see them from my house. Well, they've switched over to white lights now, and they're more directed down at the, at the, at the ground rather than up in the sky. I don't know if they were thinking maybe there was going to be an escape by helicopter, but they had the lights shining up in the, up in the sky. And um, now they're more directed down, and they're more, you know, they're not as, as big a problem. But it, it's becoming more and more of a problem around here and around uh, even rural areas. And it's a shame to have to, you know, drive two and a half, three hours to get to a dark sky, and even then it's, it's tough. So it would be nice to have someplace local. So uh, with that, that's my two cents. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much. Yep. Mr. Denver. Welcome, sir. Thanks. Uh, Paul Denver from 16 Winterberry, also from River's Edge. Um, I won't, won't be long, but uh, bef in, in an earlier session, I uh, stated uh, to you folks that I support a post-mortem, a careful investigation of the fiasco of the police station. Uh, we've had a report uh, from the town administrator, and uh, I think it raises a number of questions, and I think that this board needs to uh, have a public uh, investigation of what went wrong, uh, and more importantly, perhaps, a, a clear pathway established to prevent the problems that uh, plagued that particular project. Uh, we've spent an enormous amount of money on that project and we haven't gotten what we wanted. I think everybody agrees with that. Uh, it's time to uh, tell the people of this town precisely uh, what went wrong and why it went wrong and uh, a, have a firm plan announced to the people about how we're going to prevent that. From my point of view, uh, despite what, this, what Mr. Smith said earlier, a permanent public building committee is uh, part and parcel of the solution uh, with, with uh, people who can bring their expertise to bear and people who are independent of all the other boards in town. And I would strongly recommend that, that the, the board uh, establish or uh, try to establish and recommend to town meeting that we establish a permanent public building committee so we do not have any more problems of the depth uh, and extent that we had uh, with the police station. Thank, Thank you. you. In the back, sir. Yes. Good evening. Hi, my name is Tom Scott. I live on Wildwood Road in the village. Um, you know, there's an old saying about not beating a dead horse. I'm going to beat the dead horse. Um, in my opinion, the upward angle of tra trajectory of the real estate tax rate in this town is simply unsustainable. Unsustainable. This board must, starting at tonight's meeting, find the courage to say no loudly and clearly. When the booming economy that we're enjoying right now turns south, and it will eventually, this town will find itself bankrupt in its ability to provide even the basic services. Now, when that happens, someone may, just may, say, you know, the board held a meeting on the 7th of January in the year 2020, and they had the opportunity to turn things around, but they chose otherwise. Let's not let that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have anybody else for public comment this evening? You, you, don't, you don't get two cracks at it, but if it's something that would be of benefit to follow up, feel free. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just got to go to a microphone to say it. That's all. When you get old, you forget things, and I apologize. Um, I think the board um, should consider outsourcing as an option to reduce costs. Um, we outsourced a lot of bit in the businesses that I was in. I did a lot of outsourcing contracts, and we saved 
more money than, can, than you can imagine. And I understand that it's a situation where you don't want to let go. There are people involved, et cetera, et cetera. But the people in this community deserve at least that effort. Very That's good. That's all I want to say. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Rosenberg, it doesn't really feel like a meeting if you don't have a public comment. Uh, I'm satisfied that we've established the president. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right, so I'm hearing no other public comment this evening. That will be closing the public comment period. Moving on to our first action item, which is to please consider adopting the Attorney General's Regulations 940CMR 29.10 to permit remote participation in public meetings. Background so the board discussed this at the last meeting and asked for some follow-up. Um, I reached out to the group of all the managers, administrators in Norfolk County. Only heard back from about six of them. Um, half have not adopted it, and the other half have. Uh, one of them is Medway, so I took a, I've taken their actual policy, put it in your book. Of the three that said they have adopted it, they said it has been used sparingly and primarily by their uh, a member or two of their town's advisory or finance committee. Um, if you look here, Norfolk, excuse me, Medway's is their policy, and then there's a form that they have people use to document that someone requested the ability to, to, to um, participate remotely. So I'm afraid I wasn't able to get any more background from any other communities um, quickly. Good. Well, first, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the board and Blythe and Judith for uh, having the last meeting without me here. As you can see, I had surgery and wasn't able to attend. And I did watch the meeting about a dozen times from home. So I am well aware of the scope of the conversation and uh, everybody's position. But hearing Blythe's feedback and maybe doing your own research, is there anything that has changed from either of your perspectives as it relates to the potential of implementing remote participation? Nope. 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 No. Okay. Well, that being said, um, I, I think there are some distinct benefits to implementing something like this. Um, I, I understand the concern uh, about the negative impacts of implementing something like this, whereas somebody might want to take the opportunity to not come to town hall or not come to be at a meeting personally um, when they don't necessarily need to not be there. Um, I, I understand that position and that fear. But I think that the benefit of allowing somebody who has a legitimate reason not to attend these meetings, the opportunity to be able to provide their perspective or contribute to the conversation that's happening at that board meeting, um, far outweighs the potential for somebody to take advantage of it. Um, I also understand the concern about voting, uh, the requirement to have a roll call vote and ensuring that somebody has a uh, consistent connection to be able to make that vote or submit that vote clearly and consistently. Uh, one of the things that I inquired about was if we were able to adopt a portion that would allow somebody to provide their perspective, but not necessarily vote, uh, in the sense they'd be abstaining from the vote if they were remotely participating. But Blythe, I think you identified that. In your research, you either take the whole adoption or you take none yeah. of it, right? So, uh, so I understand that perspective as well. Uh, finally, I think the piece of this where I, I agree with the position of the board was the lack of the te technological infrastructure to be able to execute this. Um, as you can see at this point, if we don't have the benefit of NCTV here to record our meetings, we're putting an iPhone in the middle of the room to get an audio recording to submit for uh, being uploaded to YouTube. So we don't necessarily have the best technological infrastructure to be able to support something like this. So whereas private companies, my company for instance, we have Skype or video conferencing or headsets or incredible conference room modules to be able to execute this, we don't have that here. And that will make it difficult for most people, and then Chris, you had contributed the challenges associated to those who require a little bit more support in terms of hearing. Uh, so based on that item alone, uh, I, I agree with the board that we should not move forward with adopting this at this time, although I think there is great benefit to doing it, and I'd like to assess what the cost would be to outfit our facilities to be able to have something that's a little bit more accommodating for uh, an initiative like this. But at this time, I don't think that we would be really doing as good a benefit as we could to implement it without having that in place. Can I just ask a quick question? Because I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think. You know, and I'm looking at Medway's um, 
<clears throat> remote participation policy and paragraph six, talk, six talks about um, you know, all of the accommodations that would be made, TTY, et cetera, which would be an expense that right now, as we've heard from 35 minutes of public comment, we don't necessarily have the money for. There's the, I have the concern about voting. I liked the idea that they have with the sheet, sort of future reference as, if we do this again in the future. But to your point, when you asked Blythe if it was possible to have someone participate remotely without voting, um, it occurred to me, I don't know that there's any reason people can't, if you're a non-voting, if you, in other words, if, if I were on advisory committee or, or somebody were on the zoning committee, is there anything keeping me from calling up and saying, I'm stuck in traffic, but I'm interested in what's going on in tonight's meeting, I know I can't vote, can, I, can you just stick at the phone on the table and I listen in. I don't know that there's anything that prevents people who run their meetings from allowing their members to engage in that way sans voting, right? There's, I can't imagine that there's a statute that says people aren't allowed to, um, to do that. So what, right? Doesn't that, I mean, if you've got absent the, the voting, I think this seems to be about the voting component, like having the person engage as a member of the board, a voting member of the board. But if the board member wanted to participate in a way other than watching it live and emailing people, I, I imagine that they, they could do that if the person, the chair of whichever board it was, um, didn't have an issue with it. Like, they're just listening, right? Just you just put it up there and then they can talk the way anybody in the audience could talk, theoretically, right? In yeah. theory, yes. I imagine, though, there would be some weirdness when it came to quasi-judicial kind of discussions where there's well, a contentious issue. I think you're right. I think they wouldn't be able, I think it would be basically just, hey, I'm, I, I want to listen in yeah. kind of a thing. If somebody was feeling, you know, that, that it was that important that they hear things in live, live time versus watching it on TV but I, I agree that that I have the concerns regarding sinking money into the technology that we I think we really would need for people to be able to engage appropriately um, and the voting component I don't that was it I was just mulling just mulling out loud it sounds perhaps you could mullers. identify if there is any <laughs> wiggle room there in terms of sure. you know, any additional thoughts nothing Thank further you. All right, so do we have a motion here? Oh, go right ahead. Um, so at the um, December 17th meeting, Blythe talked about uh, uh, audio conferencing facilities that are available in this room and other meeting rooms in this building. And um, while the um, regulations permit other things such such as video conferencing or you know Skype or other stuff audio conferencing certainly satisfies the rules and um, according to Blythe we have adequate audio conferencing facilities in meeting rooms in this building and also other bodies who may meet other places if um, you know, given the authority to um, uh, use remote participation could decide that they want to bring in their own equipment that they acquire however they choose to acquire it without a budget. So the fact that there isn't a budget available for doing anything more than um, conference call phones should not, in my opinion, preclude using conference call phones for remote participation. Um, and on the other subject, re responding to what Cece was talking about, about um, uh, participation um, without voting. Uh, certainly any public body can um, open itself to um, the uh, participation, remote participation by the public at large as well as um, people who may have been members but are not participating as members but rather are just uh, participating as members of the general public. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, I'm certainly familiar with um, statewide bodies that allow anybody who wants to to call in to listen to the meeting. 
using freeconferencecall.com, for example. A free service That's available. Freeconferencecall.com. <laughs> Here's our plug for the night. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. <laughs> Mr. Alex? I know if I voted for somebody and they said they were going to do something to get my vote, I don't want them hiding behind a telephone, changing their vote. I want to be here looking them in the eye <laughs> when they decide to change the vote that I voted for them on. People are hiding behind a telephone? No. They're going to be in front of me. Can I ask the board? Sure. Would, would, it be, would be able to take a vote non-binding? You have a cross-section of Norfolk there right now non-binding vote and see how the people of Norfolk feel about what you're putting on the table. No, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, just because of the determination of the board is what drives if we accept this or not. We do, and that's why you elect us into these offices to make these decisions. You can, you can run against me, Ernie. But I do appreciate your insight. <laughs> I will go door to door for you. You can have my seat in two years I, if you don't like my vote on this particular issue. Mr. Alex, can you just no, clarify your, Mr. Alex, Mr. Boyle, before you give the mic away, yeah. could you just clarify for me your position is that you do not support any facet of remote participation, not just the voting component, right? Right. Perfect. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. We have a motion. I had scripted it in the positive and I'll let you take it from there how you either vote it down or vote not to take it up it's in the um, yes. right behind yep. typically number three this is why you don't have medicated chairs right. would you like, would you like to <laughs> I don't know if I'd now live that down the, I'm good thank you now you got the crutches all right, with that being said, I move that the board not adopt the Attorney General's Regulations 940 CMR 29.10 to permit remote participation in public <coughs> meetings at this time. Seconded. Point Any of, further discussion? Yeah, point of order. I think all motions have to be made in the affirmative, don't they, Blythe? I don't think you can make a motion in the, in the negative. All of the motions have to be made in the affirmative. I haven't read my Robert's Rules of Order lately. But I think, I think you can do it either way. I just took it from the positive because I thought it was more positive. She misread the room. I misread the room. I just, just okay. I, I think you can go either way. Well, I mean, technically, we wouldn't have to act on this, right? Because if we're not we adopting just, it, we're not adopting it. We move well, on. We can, you can move to make the motion, and then we can all vote no. Right. That's ah, right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's yeah. the okay. point. That's okay. how so I wrote it. it. Gotcha. You make it in the gotcha. affirmative, gotcha. and then gotcha. we all vote no. Yeah. Just because we second it I'm doesn't mean that we're Everybody right. says yes. It feels so much better. Okay. <laughs> In that case, I move that the board adopt the Attorney General's Regulations 940 CMR 29.10 to permit remote participation in public meetings. Seconded. Here's a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed? No. Aye. Very good. Our next item this evening is to please consider appointing members to Norfolk's 150th Anniversary Parade Committee. So at the last meeting, the board heard from two people who are interested in working on this, uh, Mr. Paul Terrio and Ms. Donna Jones. Um, the board agreed that we would uh, advertise for this. Uh, we did so by putting a um, notice on our website and linking the volunteer application. Uh, as of tonight, we had emails back both from Ms. Jones and Mr. Terrio saying they would like to be appointed. Um, since we know them well, we didn't ask them to do an a, a, a application. Um, we have not received any others. So at this point, we have two. And so I scripted a motion, uh, again, get, um, with the assumption that you would want to the board would want to proceed with that. Very good. Um, comments, concerns um, with appointing Mr. Terrio or Ms. Jones to the Parade committee? Uh, no, I think they're both great. I just, I, I have the same concern about the parade that I had last time, but um, 
I have no concerns about them on the committee. Just don't want to pay any money for it. There's a lot to discuss in terms of exactly how said parade would be executed at this point, but I believe that establishing a committee to yeah. own it, whether it be done right. or not, That's, um, is I a great no first issue. step. Yeah. Agreed. Concerns? Agreed. In that case, I would move that the board establish an ad hoc committee to organize a parade to celebrate Norfolk's 150th anniversary and appoint Paul Terrio and Donna Jones as members. Second. Here is second. Any further discussion? No. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, our next item this evening is to please consider opening the warrant for the May 12th, 2020 annual town meeting. Thank you. In your packet is a calendar of steps necessary to get from uh, tonight through to May 12th, which is the second Tuesday in May. Um, the notices, if you, if you vote in the affirmative, the notices will go out tomorrow and the warrant would be open until Thursday, February 13th, which gives the board time to review the list of articles, um, gather the language from the various boards, committees, or petitioners, work through with town council the language of the warrant so that the board can sign it in late April, uh, post it, give plenty of time for advisory to have their meetings and be able to take their, make their determination about what they're recommending um, and again, get to the meeting on, on May 12th. Give ourselves more time than we did in the fall. It seemed like that was a little bit rushed, uh, especially for this board to take time to consider everything and for advisory. So we've moved it up a little bit from from the fall. Very good. Um, I will report back from the B1 Working Zoning Committee that at last night's meeting, the committee established that the new target for the proposal of those articles will be the fall town meeting. So um, as it pertains to what we have listed in coming up for the spring town meeting, uh, the committee's direction at this point is now to target the fall mm -hmm. um, to bring those forward. So. That frees up a whole bunch of time for us to talk about a bunch of other stuff. Yep. Comments, concerns related to opening the warrant? No concern. Nope. nope. Plug it in there, calendar. All right, so with that, I would move that the board vote to open a warrant for the 2020 annual town meeting to be held at King Philip Middle School on Tuesday, May 12, 2020, and to close the warrant on Thursday, February 13th at 6 p.m. Second a motion. Here is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Our next item this evening is to please consider granting permission to the Garden Club of Norfolk to use Town Hill Bandstand for its annual plant and bake sale to be held on Saturday, May 16th, 2020, from 9 to 12 p.m., with Town Hill Bandstand being requested from 8 to 12.30 p.m. So this is a typical annual um, request by the Garden Club to hold their sale. Um, We've checked with the various departments, no issues, no concerns. Um, separately, as you probably know, we handle requests for signs in our office. We work with the, the uh, police department on those. So we don't need you to approve the sign request, just the use of Town Hill and the ability to put up a banner at a location that they and Public Works work out to be appropriate to advertise it. Thank you. Is police involved in that at all to ensure that signs don't impede sight lines and safety and things of that nature? Um, I th I'm not sure that on Town Hill that's an issue for traffic. Right. It, uh, signs more that if they're located at intersections or on town property that they're not impeding someone's ability to drive their car safely. Not that I'm saying somebody's going to put a billboard up at the roundabout, but just... We'll make sure. Yeah. Questions, comments, sure. concerns? Nope. Um, not seeing any comments. So with that, I move that the board approve the Garden Club's request to reserve Town Hill and bandstand for their annual plant and bake sale on May 16th. And furthermore, to erect a banner on Town Hill from May 16th, May 11th to May 16th. Second. Here is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Our next item this evening is to please consider appointing a delegate to cast Norfolk's vote for various MIAA, MIIA insurance committees. So we're part of the Maya uh, group of... Uh, uh, insurance uh, trust for health insurance and for procurement of property casualty, school board liability, and, and other types of insurances. And the board has its annual meeting as part of the Massachusetts Municipal Association meeting in um, 
Boston later this month, and they need each community to determine who's going to be their delegate to vote for the members of either the Property and Casualty <coughs> Board or the Health Insurance Board. Um, they also have in here, um, if any community want to um, uh, nominate any other people to be on the board, there's a form for that. That typically doesn't happen. Uh, usually the, the leadership of um, MMA kind of looks for people to serve. So I'm going to be going to the meeting anyway because I'm on the property and casualty board. So I'm suggesting since I'm the one going, I will be the one to lift the card. I'm not up for any election, so I'm not voting for myself. Um, and so um, it has, whoever is the delegate has to be determined by the executive board, which is the board, the select board. So that's why it's in your packet. Um, and if anyone would like to join me on that Saturday afternoon instead, it'd be fine. So, so tempting. Yes. Really. I know, it's, it's really exciting. Does anybody have any strong feelings about another nomination for somebody? To join? Well, I think the requirements are you have to be either a member of the select board or the town administrator, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Nope. <laughs> With that, I would move that the board designate Blythe Robinson, town administrator, to cast Norfolk's vote for various MIIA, why do I have such a problem with that? <laughs> Insurance committees at the 2020 MIA annual meeting. There we go. There you I'll go. Say second. Here a second. Do I see any further discussion? I see none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Our next item this evening is to please consider signing an agreement regarding the Caritas property exempt from real estate taxes under provisions of MGL Chapter 59, Section 5, Clause 3rd. So for a number of years, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not sure exactly how many, uh, since the hospital no longer was operating as a hospital and was not operating in its tax-exempt status as a charitable organization, um, Folks prior to myself and the assessor who's here to, uh, now, Don Clark, had um, negotiated an agreement with the hospital to pay um, a, a payment in lieu of taxes, otherwise known as a pilot agreement, to the community for some obligation for taxes. Um, this agreement has come to the board each January, and it, it, refer it references the three properties that are... Um, owned by this group and the amount of tax, the amount that they have agreed to pay increases each year by two and a half percent. So this $69,791.13 is a two and a half percent increase over the, the amount that was in last year's agreement. Um, as you know, there has been you know some interest in in the development of the of the hospital, and you know that's something we 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 want to see move forward for various reasons and see it pay its its full amount of taxes that should be due on a property like that. But until then, a pilot agreement is a is a very typical and appropriate way to negotiate some payment of taxes for the benefit of the community um, rather than receiving nothing which is actually quite possible so i would recommend that the board um, approve this and this will be for this fiscal year it's done annually thank you questions so does the um, the value by which we're raising two and a half percent has that ever increased or is it was it set some time ago in i believe words, like it was set values continue to go up and right. we keep on paying on that yeah this isn't it, it, it if you add up all of the assessed value of these three parcels, 69000 it would be more than $69,000 in taxes. The, the other side of that equation is that if, if this went to court, if we were challenged, um, according to the assessor um, and the recent case decisions on pilots, could leave us vulnerable to receiving possibly nothing and possibly having to pay monies back. So what I'm suggesting is we have a, a willing uh, taxpayer, if you will, and, 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 I th and hopefully a willing community that maybe this isn't everything that we should receive, but we are vulnerable to receiving far less or nothing at all. And I think our efforts are better spent working towards a solution for that property and it can get to its next stage of life and hopefully be more productive for the community 
um, in various ways, including payment of taxes. Um, but until then, I think we're not in a position to negotiate this much higher. Is, is the reason for that being, I mean, if it's no longer, it, it no longer enjoys its tax exempt status, why wouldn't it be subject to taxation similar to anybody else who owns property in town? Because it's in an area where it, it's owned by a, a um, organization that has is tax exempt. It's considered charitable, and so there would likely be a, a legal um, wrangling over whether it's truly still exempt or not. Uh, we'll spend you know we'll spend legal resources going to court over that, and the assessor indicates to me that that might not turn out favor favorably for us. So unfortunately, while we'd like to receive much more than this and we want to work towards being able to have that property do that in the future, um, we're probably better off continuing with a, a, a pathway that's been acceptable to both parties in the past. Uh, and like I said, put our efforts towards figuring out how we can um, move that property towards being more on the tax rolls fully. Thank you. I'm not suggesting it's an ideal outcome. I think it's the best outcome considering the circumstances. And this is something that we would revisit each year. We have. Uh, um, as I say, when I first arrived here last year, I was, was concerned that we were receiving anything. Went downstairs, talked to the assessors. They showed me this very same agreement, just at 2.5% less, and said, no, this has been happening every year. Somehow it was negotiated in the past. And I think with everyone hoping that we were going to get to a solution on Southwood, you know, faster than we have. But there has been some real interest in the last year or two, and I think that's something that we should really work hard at so that we can hopefully, say, get this from where it is today to something better. Questions? Nope. Comments? No. I get it. Anything else, Chris? Nope. Uh, do you have a microphone? It's for the people at home. They can hear you on the Apologize. recording. I'm a little confused about what is the usage of the property now that you're getting $69,000 for? There's really no usage. It's the closed Southwood Hospital. It's been closed for 10 years, longer. It's, it's a hazardous waste. Uh, there's hazardous waste there. And, and um, because of what was left behind by the hospital... Um, and so the, it's got challenges as a property. It's 83 acres um, on the Walpole line. And th so it probably has some development potential right. and, and, a, and a higher and better use than it's in today. But there hasn't been an interested purchaser of it. Uh, and there are restrictions on how the property can be used. So there's a lot to work through to get it to the point where someone wants to come and do something different with it that's acceptable to the town of Norfolk. So I guess my question is, why is somebody paying $69,000 to you or to Norfolk for a piece of property that they can't use, number one? It sounds to me kind of, I don't understand that. It, it's very typical in a lot of places. I think Boston, Boston has done the most work of the, on this in, in, in this area to approach um, organizations that have a charitable purpose and therefore are exempt from paying taxes, such as um, hospitals or universities um, or uh, uh, churches. Um, and when they're actually functioning, they do use some you know, municipal resources. They might have to call the police department. They might have to call the fire department. There are, there, and there are, communities have reached agreements with these groups to try to receive some taxes from the property, even though they actually don't have to pay anything. So prior to, I'm not sure how many years ago, those who came before us in the town must have approached this group and said, Let's negotiate a reasonable amount of dollars paid to the town to offset its own costs, and that's the agreement that we vote annually. Second question I have is, 
due to the fact that there are 83 acres that you could pro is it zone commercial or residential it's got, it's got a, it has a zoning restriction on it. it has to be used for medical what if you did studies uh, of the property to see how much it would cost to alleviate that issue because um, when I was working at a company we used a, uh, a uh, an attorney that specialized in that in order to clear up land that had been similar and then we sold that land at a significant amount of money has any work been done on trying to figure out what has to be done to it in order to make it saleable so there's been countless man hours that have been spent on the Southwood Hospital if you googled it you'll find it you can look at all sorts of videos about it you could probably who'd be the best person for him to come and meet and talk with off this particular clock to bring himself up to speed on something that everybody's pretty comfortable talking about but I bet you there's people who are more expert at filling them in or where you know there's got to be a resource that could would that be you Blythe or would you prefer Rich? Rich, be Rich, Rich is a better kind. So our town planner Rich McCarthy would be the best one. So to I should you. set up a meeting with him. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. It's got a big history, right. and we're not going to spend the next three hours. No, no, it wasn't. Speed on it. Wasn't my intention no, to I do know, that. I'm, but I'm saying that you, it is interesting, and there's 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 a lot to it, and trying to find the right person who is interested in remediating a potential issue with stuff leaching into the right there's a lot of issues yeah so, like i said um, i dealt with it before i think i think um, and, talking and with rich i think there is maybe and there is a solution there was a whole, there was a whole study about three years ago when we had a potential buyer right and they looked at cleaning up the property then it was going to be subdivided some of it was going to be senior housing which is what it's zoned for some right. it was going to be medical some was going to be retail but obviously the cost of cleanup was too extensive at that point. So that's they had the question. Yeah. Um, and that's been the whole problem. Rich has a whole file on it. Okay. There's a group out of New Jersey that, um, that worked on this. But right. uh, it does have a lot of challenges. There's actually a cemetery up there. Okay. A lot of radioactivity, radioactive material has been buried. X-rays have been mess. buried. Okay. And Literally. one of the reasons for the pilot program <laughs> is because the years ago, um, the town had to um, usually send up the police up there because there's a number of brick buildings that were vandalized. So they found young kids were in there. So I think part of the pilot program was to alleviate the cost of the town of constantly having to go up there to address these issues. Right. So I think that answers the first part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alex. On the a little twist of that that you're talking about, we have uh, deadlocked land in this town that's never getting built on. It's bookmarked. Now, why can't we set something up that every time somebody takes out a building permit, you can come in and you can renew it the following year? But what if we set it up that after the following year, if no work is being done, at the end of that period, they have to pay tax-wise what they would be paying if the building was completed? So you assess the property with a theoretical building being there and charge them tax based on that assessment? If we have the rules that after the second time you have the second permit, if you don't do nothing, I you think pay we full taxes. I think we're going to need to check in with the State Department of Revenue because they're pretty strict about how we can how we can assess things, and I want to make sure we would run afoul of those well, rules. You could, you could set it up that before they got the third extension of their building permit, they paid the third, the price of that third building permit would be the price of a full building being taxed. Oh, I very, I very much. You'd be skirting it that way. I understand your point. I just, since the Department of Revenue, the state actually has to approve our values that we put on properties, I w we would want to make sure that that was something we would find acceptable. Yeah, I don't think anybody would disagree with the encouragement to right. tax and, and encourage <laughs> growth instead of just sitting on land. I think well, everybody's in We could in probably skirt there. the state by making it a <laughs> town ordinance on getting a permit. The price of the permit would be uh, what the valuation of that building would be. While I'm a little wary of going forward with using terms like skirting state regulation in an open meeting, I agree we should be creative about finding ways to do that. So we'll, we'll, we'll dig in to see if there's any opportunity there. Absolutely. Thank you. We don't want to skirt. 
But there could be a penalty. Instead of doing it that way, there could be a penalty assessed. Probably a little bit more effective. Got it. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion on this? Nope. CC, no. Chris? No discussion. Nope. No, sir. All right. In that case, I would move that the board execute an agreement with TASCNH Incorporated for a pilot agreement for full year 2020, fiscal year 2020, <laughs> for the property formerly known as the Caritas Norwood Hospital Incorporated. Second. Here a second. Any further discussion? Nope. Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. So we're skipping MSBA tonight, and that brings us to our discussion items this evening. Our first and only discussion item tonight is to please discuss the parameters for the fiscal year 21 town operating budget. So we discussed the budget at length at the last meeting and um, agreed that it would be helpful before any parameters are s uh, fully set um, to get some more information about what um, the, what the discussion, which was last week, uh, a zero increase budget on or not a two and a half percent tax increase budget or a level service budget, all of those terms were used. So in your packet is um, about a page or so from myself about some of the things that are difficult to amend in the budget or things that we are union contracts that we're already obligated to and issues coming up next year that we have to be prepared for. For instance, there are three elections in, in FY21 rather than one additional cost for that. It's an annual fi five year reevaluation of all properties required by the state additional cost for those sorts of things. I've also included a run from the a recent budget in your packet, which is um, took a highlight or two of all the line items that would be very difficult to change. Debt service, uh, utilities. Um, I have not um, made any uh, highlights to s salaries because you s we certainly, there could be a conversation about how many people uh, we need to do whatever the particular job is. It's just informational um, and I try to keep it at a very high level. So that's just for you to look at, at your leisure if you have any questions. But I think um, more importantly tonight, as you know, the large single part of our budget is schools, whether it's uh, Norfolk schools or King Philip. <coughs> Both the superintendent, Superintendent Alardi and um, Paul Zinni are here to give you some early understanding of what they're putting together for budgets and, and what they see, uh, what it might mean if, if they had to, if they were asked to you know, provide to the, t to the board one of those levels of budgets. Um, we're all in an, all three of us are in a, in a position right now where we're still waiting for information. The state's budget um, hasn't come out. We're not sure what the Chapter 70 changes will mean for school revenue. Um, we don't know what our, uh, um, our health insurance increases uh, will be. So we're all still working through all that. But with that, they've both been working on their budgets for a while. Um, and I will leave it to you how you want to proceed with having them come up and, and address the board. Very good. Thank you. Uh, far be it for me to make you sit here any longer than you need to. But before you come up here, I'd just like to take my opportunity to give some perspective on the scope of the discussion. Um, while I might not necessarily agree with the perception of the level of scrutiny that's been given to the budget in years past, especially given my vast knowledge and experience of one year in doing it, um, I do feel that there is a great opportunity here to provide a little bit more transparency in the process. And I think much of the scope of the conversation that was provided in the last meeting was centered around being able to have that level of detail, that level of visual, and that level of transparency out there. So not only a board and town administrator with a single year of experience between all of us, but also a community who has renewed interest in the finances of the town could get a clear view into the process and the decision making that goes into coming up with that final product. So I think we're aligned in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with the uh, direction to 
be able to take a, a harder look at all of the detailed analysis associated to each and every department in town consistently among all departments um, and be able to identify not only what brought us to the funding levels we were at last year with detail but also to identify any increases past that in detail and how we would be able to adjust for anything in between. Um, I feel that as a budget process, as an exercise to be able to bring everybody up to speed and align, there's a lot of value in that. Uh, I feel that there's, there's a great chunk of information that could be shared that would give not only the board but also the community confidence in the manner in which we take to be able to get to these decision points. So I, I agree with the board in that sense as well. To that point, what I prepared was an outline of exactly how that process should work so that we could give the town and the departments some clear direction as to what we want them to bring us and what that review process is going to look like mm -hmm. um, past just saying, give us this with this percentage. Um, I outlined in a message to Blythe uh, kind of my thoughts about what that process, you going back and watching the meeting a couple times, hearing the points about what everybody felt was important and what they specifically wanted to see, and came up with a bullet list of how those review sessions would work. So if I could, I'll go through that quickly, offer the opportunity to kind of question, comment, tweak, adjust, uh, and then we can move forward with the school presentation to kind of kick that whole thing off. Does that make sense to everybody? Heck yeah. Beautiful. Love the enthusiasm. That's me. I am enthusiastic. Okay, so uh, we started this off by identifying uh, that the town administrator and the finance director will work with the department heads on building to the submission template that Blythe has presented to the board. Uh, that template essentially outlines not only some descriptions about the individual department, their scope, their focus, their staffing levels, but also uh, a line-by-line -line comparison of their numbers from actual to budget for prior years. Um, there will be a review with the Board of Selectmen, which will be scheduled. What we're thinking right now is a, a Saturday that would be dedicated specifically to budget review, that we would just have each department come in, go through their session of review, and then move on to the next one. We do our questioning, we get our information, we go through uh, public comment, if there is any, um, and then we're able to get everything that we need to be able to group this up into a high-level 50,000-foot view of the budget as a whole. Saturdays are not defined just yet. I see some commenting and people whispering, but we haven't defined that as Saturdays. We just figured that would give us the best opportunity to be able to get everything in one fell swoop. Um, for each department, the town administrator and finance director will run point on the presentation and outline with the department head on hand to fill any blanks or provide any additional commentary on questions. So obviously, we can talk about where most of the presentation responsibility lies, but the point was that we wanted the town administrator and the finance director to be a big piece of that presentation. Uh, the review will be broken up into three parts. The first will be a detailed review of prior year funding levels. Uh, at this stage, the board, may, the board may ask questions related to the individual line items from prior year. The goal will be to establish an aligned baseline for building forward. So this will be our opportunity to be able to outline and establish what prior year funding levels had gotten us in terms of level service. So if we wanted to go through and identify and say, hey, look, we see that you had $5,000 in this line item. We see that you didn't use that. Let's talk about why you needed that money in the first place. We could get on the same page in terms of why funding was at that level prior year and essentially give us all a baseline to start working off of in terms of additional funding moving and potential additional funding moving into the next year. Uh, the second part of the presentation will be uh, an outline of what a zero increase to that prior year, finance, uh, prior year financing level uh, would impact to operations and services. So essentially once our, our baseline is established, uh, we would have the department at that time outline uh, if they were to maintain those funding levels into fiscal year 21, what the impact would be to services and what the impact would be to um, the operating procedures within that budget. Um, so this would be the time where they would highlight their fixed costs, identify how that would need to be mitigated with prior year funding levels, and identify what impact we would see on the back end to residents based on those funding levels. The final part of the presentation would be the proposal of requested funding levels for fiscal year 21. So once we establish what a zero increase impact identifies and it's understood, uh, the department will then present what their requested funding levels are for fiscal year 21. So we'd be able to take what a consistent prior year funding level would be and then what they are requesting for the fiscal year 21 budget in terms of what's needed, wants, concerns, all those kind of fun things. And then we can establish in that gap 
what funding levels we'd like to assess and vote on at that point. Now, obviously, no decisions would be made during these review sessions. This is to collect information, make our notes, ask our questions, and then we'd be in another deliberation session, likely going through the specifics about how we want this to work from a higher level, the push and pull between departments to be able to get us to that one number. Um, so, like I said, we wouldn't be inclined to make a decision that night. There'd be another session scheduled for deliberation. Um, and that was essentially it. Now, like I said, a lot, I mean, there would be a component in which we would be sending forward the budget for advisory review and commentary. I know there was just some discussion as well about the advisory committee's role in this process. Um, at what point they would be involved. I had a good discussion with Arthur Franzak to discuss his perception as well as mine. Um, I think we're aligned as well as, you know, this board is the one who is responsible for preparing this budget. And the value in the advisory committee is their review after we have built that budget and their perspective based on, you know, the much more diverse uh, personalities and people they have there that better represent the larger community, in my opinion, um, and then being able to provide that kind of feedback from there. Now, if we have any glaring differences, they, are, they feel very strongly that we did not do something that they wanted to see. We established that we could have a joint meeting after that point where they could outline those concerns and then the board could be the one to address them and give them some kind of feedback and direction as to why we made that decision as opposed to playing the you know telephone game with somebody going to their meeting somebody going to our meeting mm -hmm. one individual being designated and such like so that's what i came up with just in viewing the meeting um i did like i said i viewed it about a dozen times to make sure i didn't sad, miss anything sad life. but <laughs> a lot of time on the couch the last couple of weeks uh, but I would like to open it up to your perspective as to how that lines up with your expectations. I like or, it. Oh. Yeah, I really like it. Okay. I think it's a good start. Yep. I think also we want to include the, the two other towns I think we talked about. Correct. With regard to the regional school budget. Yep. Try to do all the selectmen with the regional school instead of each town, you know, fighting for their little piece of it. Yep. I've I'm already sure reached out to that. Jeff and Joe, and they are both amenable to that as well. Great. All right. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we have something that resembles a structure for direction. Blythe, do you feel confident that this gives you what you need to be able to execute? The only thing I'm missing is what date are we going to get together? Okay, so we can do we that. We can do that at the end of the night. Yep, yeah. very good. I so I do apologize for putting you guys through this. Sir, uh, if, if you have, is it a question or is it a comment? What do you have for us? Uh, go right ahead, and, but please be brief as uh, we're looking to execute some presentations. I think from a taxpayer's perspective, we want to see change. And I think if you go to a department head and tell them, okay, I'm going to give you as much as you had last year, tell me what the consequences are going to be. If I'm in charge of the department, I'm going to tell you, all hell is going to break loose. You can't do that. I need money. So I, I don't know. I, don't, I just don't see the force to make people look at their budget, see where they can cut it. We don't want to know all, all the consequences. Sure, you're going to have consequences, but you should be able to uh, prevent or minimize the consequences. And I know in Medfield, they went around to all the departments and told you, you got to take a 2% haircut. Everybody. And they had to go through their budgets, but they wound up with, with the 2% cut. The way you're going here now, you don't know what you're going to come out with. You might come out with, yeah, it's okay, it is, or oh, we need 3%. Wow. So I, I just don't think it's going to, what happened to zero-based budgeting? Well, there are some components of zero-based budgeting included in this process where we are asking people to define not only what they're looking for an increase the prior year, but to justify how they got those levels the prior year. And from my perspective, it's this board's responsibility to get to the bottom of those opportunities, as I would probably like to label them. Um, that's what our job is going to be as we go through these detailed review sessions, as well as the public who's welcome to join. So we'll have these posted, we'll have them available for everybody right. to join, and it will be a focus moving forward. Very, very brief, please. Of course. I re re reiterate what he said. Okay. Zero-based budgeting. Mm -hmm. And um, I hear percentage increase. I don't hear percentage decrease. When I was working at Children's Hospital, I bring that issue because we ran this before. We ran this route. Mm -hmm. And the state didn't say to us, what's your percentage increase? They basically said, I want you to cut 10%. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you have to do here, but if you work from budget to budget, there's a lot of bloat in the budget. We have to analyze where the bloat is, and we're not doing that in this procedure. 
I don't think. So if somebody can identify what the bloat is in each department, and I'm sure there is, that has to be taken out. And that personal, will be part of our review process. Personal Absolutely. experience, that's all. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. All yeah. right. Kevin, I think I think um I think you I think you I think there may be missing. There is a there's a large part of zero based budget in here. I think we asked we're gonna ask for employee head counts. Yep. And and we're gonna be looking at budgets from prior years, which it's not gonna just be the prior year. I think we're gonna go back and look at the head counts number of people in each department. They're gonna based on Blight's formula justify what they're doing in each department. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think this will have a large component of zero based budget in it. I've already asked um, Todd Lindmark to provide the last five years capital, supply, and expenditures of anything over, and I think we want to establish a baseline. Yep. Do we want to establish a baseline now of any expenses over $2,500 or $5,000 so we can look at a trend to see where the money has been spent over the last five years? I don't know what your perspective is on that. Oh, I think it makes sense, but I'd like to take the opportunity to look at the sheet that Todd sent out a little bit earlier. I haven't okay. had the opportunity to go okay. through it yet, but I, I think I like the approach. I, okay. I think it makes sense. Okay. My, my, my concern with right now with, with the school is this to me looks like a budget presentation and on our agenda is a description or a methodology of how we're going to do a budget. What I see here, if it looks like it's going to be what's up here is this is a school budget presentation, which I don't think is what we plan on having this evening. They're not ready to make a full budget presentation. All we've asked them to do is where you're at in the budget right now, please help us understand what a level funded budget would mean and what goes into that so but isn't that a budget pres that is a budget review as opposed to on our agenda we do we have please discuss parameters of the fy21 operating budget we don't have budget reviews or budget presentations the goal is by the school department so, so i'm concerned that we're this is a budget presentation which will be done on a saturday or a weeknight or whatever we decide to do this where they'll be presenting their challenges to get to 2000 21 budget so I'm concerned that we're doing a budget presentation tonight as opposed to discussing the parameters of a budget so what they provided tonight was essentially the second part of what we'd be expecting during our budget review process right correct but we saw value in them being able to deliver this ahead of time given the amount of allocation that we have in our town for education services our budget is made up <laughs> vastly a majority towards our schools and in most cases, rightfully so. But I think the importance of being able to get this out here ahead of time so that we have the opportunity to not only hear, but digest, take notes, ask questions, and be able to start that process before we get to our Saturday budget review sessions was not only a value to this board, but also to the community that would like to know it as well. So I, I saw value in this coming out ahead of time. I agree that it might not fit specifically into the parameter of the agenda item, which I, I'm not sure if that's your main concern or not, but. I, I think there's value in them delivering this to us now ahead of the point where we get into the full budget review session. Couldn't, I, couldn't you also say, given whether or not the schools are the largest part of the budget or not, in our town they are, probably in most towns they are, couldn't you say, I mean I sort of took it that exploring the impact of a zero increase budget on the schools is one of the parameters with it within which we have to work right right I mean what the impact of that budget would be on the largest contributing component of our budget yeah. is a parameter mm -hmm. this is meant to be informational so you can continue to discuss the parameters it's not meant to be their budget I can tell you they're not ready to do that yet I thought problem it was just it, information the problem is it clearly identifies level funding budgets will cause reductions in programs and positions. So it's the chicken little, the sky is... Is that the door? It's That's the doorbell. I'm hungry. It's, it's the chicken little, pizza? the sky is falling. I mean, both these presentations talk about reduced positions and reduced programs, which I think scares the public because we haven't had an opportunity yet to sit with them and have them dig deep into their budgets and do it. It's already, if you level fund me, I'm going to cut 30 positions, $1.6 million at the regional level, I'm going to cut $600,000 at the local level, and you're going to lose programs. I can see the news flash tomorrow. No more arts and music at the elementary school because they're level funding the budget. We, we haven't had the discussion with them as to digging deep into their budget. So this commentary, which is what I think it is, scares me at this time. 
but no matter when we have the common the, the the communications with them when they're ready to talk about their budget in the in the early phase of the process you're not going to change their mind i'm not going to change their mind their position is going to be the sky is falling or it's great or we're going to need to tighten our belts a little bit whatever their position is going to be and whether we have it in a breakout session which is still open people are still going to be filling the seats people are still going to be watching or whether it's tonight i don't know that that's gonna change like i don't think us sitting down in a in a in a sort of a kumbaya group hug session is going to change the the overarching concerns that they may they being the school committees and the um the folks representing the schools are going to have i mean i think you're right that if if it's something that's of concern we're going to see it tomorrow and everyone's going to see everybody's facebook posts and read all of the delightful editorial comments about our our process um but that is what it is right the, the, the editorials are coming whether it's coming tomorrow or it's coming after our saturday breakout session the editorials are coming and I would hope that my introduction to this and identifying the informational nature of these steps to get us to a process for assessment to make decisions at a later date would help mitigate some of that concern in the community. I understand that it likely will not mitigate all concern in the community, but I think it's important that we noted the fact that this is for informational purposes only, and it's important that we have this kind of information as soon as possible before we get to that table on those Saturday sessions, in my personal opinion. I don't see that there's any risk associated to hearing this now uh, that would outweigh the benefit of us having it as soon as possible. Okay. I disagree with both of you. I think it's, I think it's premature. I think both of them have presented budgets already saying, as we've heard already, the sky is falling. You're going to cost positions. You're going to cost programs. And they haven't even had a chance to use your formula to go into their budgets and look at their budgets really deep sixing. So I think that already, already they've both come across with a negative approach. They've both said you're going to cut funding, you're going to cost programs, you're going to cost positions, as opposed to using your program there to say, let us go back, really look at this, and then come forward. And it doesn't give the board time or the public time to really understand it. They're not going to be part of the budget process. We're going to see this at a very, as you said, 50,000 square feet level. It doesn't give people time to look deep into it. Right now, how many employees are hired by there in the school system? You don't know that. I don't know that. We, it's in here. I can see it. But we've had no time to assess that. And I think coming forward with a negative approach, which is what this does show, I think is premature. But that's my opinion. But certainly, um, we're all entitled to it. Yeah, I think from my perspective, if they do come forward with a negative approach, and there are things highlighted in this presentation that we have distinct differences of, of opinion or fundamental approach with, this gives us the opportunity to address that prior to the point where we sit down for a full budget review. I think that's right. I also think that it's, it's if, if we end up with a presentation that is is 90% the sky is falling and we later learn that there were actually things that they could have done and they didn't, well, then they've destroyed my trust in the process with them for years the next year. I'm not going to buy anything they say, and they know that. And Ingrid's like, yeah, because she, like, I, I think that they, They've done the work. I trust that they've done the work, but we'll find out if they've done the work when we have those breakout sessions. And and it's going to be really bad if we're being pitched today that it's you know shock and awe and decimation of people's jobs, and then we later learn that there were areas that could have been cut, and the awe is not so shocking. I think that's going to be that would be disappointing. For me, I would really be troubled by that, and I don't, I don't think that that's going to happen. Okay. Uh, no public comment for this portion. We we associated the fact that for presentations this evening we would be going through those without public comment. So, please proceed. I'm first, I guess, and then Paul will follow. Um. We just need a minute to get this presentation up. <coughs> so thank you for providing us with the opportunity to come and share some information about the school budget process. Um, 
I did have the chance to watch your meeting uh, a couple of times last time, and it was. Oh, I'm sorry. And the microphone's not going to help with that. No, no, it doesn't. You're going to have to. It doesn't just record. Yep. Oh, okay. I'll try to project a little bit more. Sorry. Um, it was our understanding that the committee was, or the board was seeking at this time, a better understanding of how the school develops the budget. So in this presentation, we've tried to provide a, an explanation about how we go about the process of building the budget request. Um, and it was also un our understanding that the board was interested in understanding what a zero could potentially look like. We are very early in the budget process, and as I go through this, I'll talk about areas that we're still tracking that we're not sure how they're going to fall, um, such as kindergarten enrollment, um, that could break favorably and allow us to reduce our request. So I'll talk about those things throughout. Um, I do just want to mention that we have several people from the school here, so if you have questions after, the budget subcommittee is here from the Norfolk Schools that may be able to answer some of them as well. In the back, we have Todd Hassett, who is our district business consultant, um, so he's here. Uh, Jeffrey Curry, school committee member. Paul Cochran is our budget subcommittee chair and also school committee member. Uh, Thomas Doyle, chair of the school committee. You want to wave or no? And Medora Champagne, who is <laughs> another budget subcommittee member as well. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Jen came in late and sat right in front of me. So Jen. Oh, wow, she called that out off the bat, huh? Sorry, I, we had a whole row, so I apologize. Um, and again, this is, I would have to say, this is not a, f a full budget, budget presentation. We really won't have that probably till February, till we have solid enrollment projections and figures um, and a few other, other things that we need to put in place before we can finalize the number. And it's not scrolling. So copies of this going to be available for uh, for people to we can certainly make them available yep. so as far as our budget process we do always start out by thinking about the district vision and our mission um, we are public education so we provide educational services and supports to every child in the community regardless of their uh, learning style educational needs um, background uh, we provide education to all um, our vision is to teach, inspire, empower, and succeed. And the mission statement that was developed with input from the community is to offer a safe, joyful, challenging learning environment that meets the needs of our diverse students and through school, family, and community partnerships to provide an education that inspires lifelong learners and cultivates caring and productive citizens, uh, citizens of the ever-changing world. Sorry, I'm having, there we go. So in terms of, you know, I appreciated your comments, I think, in the meeting where you talked about um, the board being fairly new. Uh, the select board has a huge responsibility in terms of balancing the budget, bringing forward something that's responsible to the town. I think our school board appreciates that. Um, and so we wanted to try to explain how we could think about the budget. Uh, the schools really do follow a zero-based budget approach, so I'll talk about that. Um, in that process, the first step for us is to take a look at staffing. Um, when we look at staffing, the staffing needs of the district change annually. We start by looking at our enrollment across all grade levels. The school committee has a class size policy, how many students are appropriate to have, um, sorry, appropriate to have in each classroom, and we use that as a guide. We base our, the number of sessions or the number of classrooms we have at every grade level by the number of students we have enrolled. Uh, the only area we have to estimate is kindergarten because we don't know those students yet. Um, we have, over the past several years, moved the kindergarten enrollment process forward so that we would have a more solid number um, by January. So K enrollment for this year opened yesterday. We have 84 kids already. <laughs> so it's, uh, you have one of them too? <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> it's, so that's. Enroll? The second it came up, are you kidding me? Wow. I'm it's like, about double uh, of what we usually have. To enroll, that's me. <laughs> Did I forget? <laughs> <laughs> well, 84 people so far, but that's a variable. So no. we have projections based on the NESDEC projections of what we think we're going to see. Um, we do generally um, have a pretty good estimate by the end of the first month. So by the end of January, whatever we have registered is a pretty good estimate. We tend to pick up about five to ten more students um, after that that move in either late spring or over the summer. Um, but that should give us a pretty good number to, to base that on. So we look at that and we determine how many teachers we need at every grade level based on the enrollment. 
every single year um, our enrollment isn't flat so we have a grade level right now where we have 153 students we have another grade level with 118 so we do every year have to move teaching positions from one grade level to a, to another in order to accommodate the the enrollment sizes uh, the next thing we look at is all of our special education programs we are required by state and federal law to provide appropriate educational services to students with different learning disabilities what we do is we look at what the caseload requirements are how many minutes of instruction what the setting needs to be and then we determine how many special educators we need in order to provide those services that we're required to provide uh, we also have new requirements from the state to provide directed instruction for English language learners so and that is based on their proficiency level of being able to speak um, and learn and read in you know English and we have directed guidelines as to how much service they're required to have um, based on their proficiency level so we look at all of that and then we determine what we need for staffing for for ELL teachers as well as special education and then the last thing we look at once we know what we have and what we need in terms of staffing we look at our current staff um, uh, step uh, where they are on the salary scale and we calculate what it will cost to move them forward if they're going to get a step increase or they can also get increases in salary by making lane changes which means they acquire additional education um, they have to notify us by contract Todd is that by December 1st December 1st whether they have accrued enough credits in in graduate coursework to make a lane change so we have all that data so we actually roll over with actual numbers um, the staff that we need to move forward with steps and lane changes sometimes we have had situations where we need to reduce the teacher we don't have the enrollment to justify continuing um, with the same number of teachers so in past years we have reduced teaching staff the last two years we've had to add because we've seen a pr pretty significant growth in our population as far as the expense sides of the budget we again we do use a zero based approach to budgeting um, we have several different department heads that are responsible for developing their um, expense budgets building principals what they do is every year we secure quotes for all of our needed curriculum materials that would include textbooks workbooks software subscriptions anything like that we look at if we need math text we look at how many students we have enrolled in that grade level we usually build in three or four extras because we have move-ins and we get a quote from the vendor um, providing that for what the cost of those materials will be um, we the principals have teachers at grade levels inventory the general supplies to determine what we have sometimes we have extra supplies and we don't need to replenish them um, sometimes they have um, special projects or, or curriculum things that they need so they inventory general supplies and then we seek the best pricing um, for a number of years we were ordering our general supplies from the the bid list so the town has I think W WB Mason as the bid list um, provider we have found in recent years that we can actually do better by purchasing directly through Amazon we don't pay shipping costs in that and a lot of times they have the same materials available at lower costs so we we look for the 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 best vendor to provide the the materials that we're looking for and we get quotes for those um, so the, the general supplies budget budgets are then built upon the actual needs um, we also identify needs for any equipment replacement that we may have um, that would be technology furniture anything like that um, and then they build their budget request accordingly our special education director which is a, a, a significant portion of our budget um, sec secures actual quotes from for any students that we have outplaced from the schools that they are placed at they have to notify us um, early in the year if they are ex expecting a tuition increase and then she budgets that accordingly um, we also get quotes for transportation services if we need to provide those as well as any other contracted services that are acquired so vision therapy home-based tutoring we base those requests on the IEP requirements for the number of hours and the quote for the hourly rate um, of the service provider um, she also secures pricing for needed curriculum testing and any adaptive technology materials two other um, budgets departments that we develop budgets for our facilities budget and I should have said our our shared facilities director Matt Hafner is here tonight um, so he starts by determining budget costs for any contracted services like waste management security monitoring anything that we have a contract for um, he's been great over the last several years we've actually changed our waste management company because we found a, a different vendor to provide the same service at a lower cost um, and that realized savings for both the schools and towns 
We evaluate usage and secure quotes for any cleaning supplies and materials. And then we do use, have to use trend data to project costs for certain lines like maintenance, like plumbing rep repair, electric repair. We looked at three to five years of past spending. We think about what our average cost is and then we estimate those lines. Our technology director also does the same thing, um, determines the cost for contractual commitments for services. Um, we have contracts for printer and copier maintenance, uh, district subscriptions for our HR software, our student information system. We get those quotes, we base the request for funds on those quotes. We also have our technology departments worked really hard, um, and what we, we have a comprehensive five-year long-term technology replacement plan. So every device in the district, all of our network infrastructure, we have documentation of when they were bought, what the expected life expectancy is, uh, what the maintenance costs along the way will be, and when they'll mean, need to be replaced. So she determines the needs for a uh, tech replacement based on that five-year plan. Feel free if you have questions to stop me, I tend to talk a lot. Um, what we've done in the past is we do collaborate very early with the town. We try to get a sense early in the budget process of what the revenue stream looks like, what's realistic for the town to be able to support in terms of operating budget. Um, every year we have cut our initial request back. Um, we've looked for opportunities for savings. We've explored cost savings measures. Um, we know that the town has to balance the needs of the um, the citizens in terms of other services, other departments. We know there's limited revenue. So we have come up with a lot of different ways. We work with K King Philip to share cost for professional development. Uh, we've shared some really, um, yeah, we've worked collaboratively around special education programming so that we can de develop continuity of programming to prevent outplacements. So we work, uh, the numbers you're gonna see tonight are initial. We continue to work throughout the process to see where we can find additional savings and opportunity. Um, and we have consistently brought forward to the town a reasonable budget request that we, that the town has been able to re, um, fund. Over the past eight years, our average increase has been 3.38%. Um, this is just an overview of our timeline. So October and November is when we really work on the staffing end of the bu budget and look at enrollment numbers, determine what our special education costs are going to be and what our department men mental needs will be. November and December, the budget subcommittee meets and we make initial reductions to try to meet whatever the town has set as, as budget parameters. We share the preliminary budget with the school committee usually between January and February and also with our school councils that are comprised of staff members and community members and parents. Um, we get feedback and input. Subcommittee will then go back and consider any needed changes um, and we bring a final budget to the school committee for a vote in March. The school committee also has a public open hearing on the budget. So all of our budget subcommittee meetings, the advisory board meeting, um, the public hearing, school committee meetings, they're all open meetings and anyone is welcome to come at any point in the process to learn more about how we're, how we're approaching the budget. Um, the public hearing we also put in, we advertise in the local paper and we send a connect out, out to all of our parents in the community with the date and time for that. Um, some t after that, we go to the advisory board and share our, our budget. I would say in the past several years, the advisory board often will ask for backup information or additional material in order to better understand the school budget. So we often go back and provide additional supporting documents, um, FTE counts. Um, uh, we've had questions about specific special education costs, so we often bring back additional information. Sometimes they've had to ask us to consider additional reductions. We have had to cut positions. Um, the school committee has been really great about prioritizing educational and instructional positions. So over the past years, we've had to cut things we've cut. Um, we don't have any clerical support in our HR office or our um, payroll office anymore. Uh, so we've cut clerical, we cut clerical positions at the Freeman Kennedy. We cut a special education team chair position back. So we've tried to protect the instructional positions uh, that have the greatest return for students um, in those situations. Then we bring the final budget forward to town meeting for a public vote in May. Budget oversight, so I just wanted to highlight the Norfolk School Committee has fiscal oversight of the school budget um, and they are very conservative, I would say. Um, they, they hold me accountable, they, they monitor spending throughout the year. We provide quarterly budget up, updates to the committee. Again, those are all in public uh, open meetings. Um, we track our spending, we project out any potential savings. 
Um, so they, they exercise tight oversight over that. Um, we have five elected officials on our school committee. Um, each year the school committee chooses two members to serve on our budget subcommittee. So the budget subcommittee meets regularly and shapes the initial budget request. Um, they generally choose people who have a background in finance um, and have skill in that area. So our two, not to put you guys on the spot tonight, but our two current subcommittee members, we have Paul Cochran, who's the chair, um, who's worked in finance for over 15 years, as you can see, developing, managing nonprofit and global company finances, including operational budgets over 350 million. Um, you can read the rest of his bio there. And Medora Champagne, who is an attorney with experience in litigation, um, and also is in a current professional role as an audit counsel um, for an organization providing tactical analysis and management of legal spending. Um, so they bring a lot of experience um, throughout the process. They ask a lot of the questions you're asking me. Um, you know, what was last year's spending? Um, did we realize any savings? Do we need to bring that forward? Um, and they look line by line through the budget um, and make those recommendations. Um, we have had some budget challenges, as every department has. These are not unusual. Um, we have tried really hard to be fiscally conservative. Um, we have, as I said, had to make cuts and reductions um, across all departments. Our expense lines, even though they're, um, we develop them from a zero-based approach, sometimes we, can't, we still can't fund them. So we have had to say, Todd and I meet with every department head, go through line by line their budget, and for the past several years, we've had to level fund expense budget lines. Even though people can justify their needs and they need more um, materials or supplies, we've had to say you're going to have to cut that by 2%. We need to level fund these because our biggest budget drivers have been staffing to meet the needs of growing enrollment. Um, so we, we do make those um, cuts as needed. Again, when we have to look at position cuts, um, we, we have looked at clerical support, non-instructional positions. Um, we've looked for opportunities to share staff with other districts. Um, we had a 0.5 psychology um, position last year. We, we looked at sharing that cost with Foxborough and other groups. So we try to find ways to provide the service, same service at a lower cost. Um, we only have 0.5 assistant principals in both of our schools right now. We really need full-time assistance in both buildings. Um, we have a growing population. We have new regulations from, from the state in terms of teacher evaluation that are very time involved. And we also have a lot more students coming with social, emotional, behavioral health needs. Um, and you know, we need the, the time that's spent working with students and families is really valuable. Um, we do still have to charge fees. We, for a long time, wanted to eliminate the band fee. We want to make sure that every child has access to the music program, uh, but we haven't been able to do that, so we continue to charge that fee at this point. Um, the school committee is aware of any unfunded needs, so when we have to make reductions because we can't fully fund um, some of the things that we need, um, if we have end-of-year savings in any expense line, the committee can choose to go back and address some of those costs um, at that time. We have, uh, there were some questions around uh, how the school districts returns funds to the town at the end of the year, so I wanted to clarify. We have a responsibility to provide educational services, as I said, as public education to any child, regardless of their in, uh, learning needs. Um, we, uh, we have very strong in-district special education programs, and we can provide services that meet the, the needs of the majority of students. Every now and then you have a student that either doesn't have a peer group with like needs or has unique needs that we are not able to meet within the district. We have to be able to respond to those unexpected costs in the moment. So if we have a student that moves into the district from another district who's currently outplaced, as soon as they reside in Norfolk, we absorb the cost of that placement. Um, or there might be a student that's struggling throughout the year and, and um, you know, um, whether it's social, emotional, or behavioral, we get to a point where we can't continue to um, provide the, the supports that child needs, and we have to look at an out of district placement. So we have to be able to respond quickly. We have tried to be very, very transparent about our costs with the town and try to give a high level of detail and insight into the budget. So we've talked about this with the advisory board for several years, <coughs> and we have an agreement that we will retain one out of district placeholder in our budget. We budget for a collaborative placeholder, which is instead of a private school, we would use um, the BICO collaborative or another regional collaborative that provides services to member districts at a lower cost. And the cost of tuition for that would be 55,000. And it's 8,000 for us to transport a student. 
So we've agreed that we will hold that as a placeholder in the budget, and if we do not use those funds, we have an agreement that we return those in full to the town at the end of the fiscal year, uh, which would then go into free cash to be available to other budgets. I know you mentioned that earlier. <laughs> so that is not, um, that's not money that, that we haven't planned for. It's just that we don't that's always right. need to use it, so we would return it. Um, this year we did need to use our placeholder, so we won't have a placeholder in next year's budget. We don't anticipate being able to retain that um, with the budget challenges that the town has. Uh, returning money to the town. So the school committee does have discretion over how to allocate any end of year unspent funds that result from unexpected budget savings. In most districts, school committee uses, use the end of year funds to address maintenance, facilities, or other educational needs that they weren't able to support in the operating budget. In Norfolk, we have historically tried uh, to manage capital needs. We've had, I mean, everybody's seen in the news, we've had increased threats to school safety um, that we've had to respond to as a district. We added additional security cameras to HL of Day so that we would be able to better monitor visitors coming into the building. Um, so some of those needs, if we have savings at the end of the year, the committee can vote to reappropriate funds to, to manage some of those costs. Um, at the same time, we've also really worked hard to partner with the town because you also sometimes have unexpected budget costs that come. Um, there's been years that the snow, uh, snow and ice removal budget has been exhausted 2015. I think every other day I was calling much to parents' horror canceling school because we had snow emergencies. So we talk with the town as we get close to the end of the year um, and say these are some of the needs that we have that the committee would like to address, what are your needs, and when we can, we have partnered to try to return additional funds. Um, this is just a five-year budget summary. So you can see 2019, 2018, we returned basically the cost of the placeholder plus a little bit of extra. Um, 2017, 16, and 15, we returned significantly more money. In 2015, that was the year of um, uh, snowmageddon. I mean, it was the year that we had significant shortfall on the town side for the snow and ice budget. Um, Jack Hathaway had reached out and said, is there anything you guys can do? We actually enforced a budget freeze. We stopped all spending in terms of supplies and maintenance. Um, we left uh, some uh, professional development funds, legal funds, um, and we didn't purchase anything at the end of the year. We returned as much as we could to the town. Um, so that was about 250000 uh, at the, in that year. I just wanted to highlight, so even though we follow a zero-based approach to budgeting, there are potential areas that we have to estimate that we, we can realize savings in. Um, so some of the budget lines that we're required to estimate that are subject to change, one is district legal expenses. We estimate that, again, based on two things. We look at past trend data, so we look at what the spend has been for the past three to five years, but we also consider known conditions. So for example, this year we're renegotiating uh, the new teacher contract. We're going to need additional funds to fund the legal um, counsel's advice to review contract proposals and participate in those negotiation meetings. Substitute teachers, we have to estimate that line, again, based on our past spending patterns. We could have a year that we don't have a lot of staff members out, you know, that, that it breaks our way, that there's not a lot of, of illness. Um, we've had other years where people have had to go out for extended medical leaves who were, were funding the sick leave time as well as a, a substitute replacement. So that's based on an estimate, but sometimes, you know, sometimes it breaks for us, sometimes it goes the other way. Also, when we have new positions and we have new hires to make, we have to estimate what the salary will be for those people coming in. We estimate um, typically master's five, which is a place on our salary scale. The reason we estimate that is that the state now has changed requirements and all new teachers are required to get the master's degree, a master's degree within the first five years of teaching. So almost everybody we see comes in with a master's. We also have good recruiting power in Norfolk. Um, and we try to hire the best candidate we can for the position. We have hired for some of our critical shortage positions like special education, therapeutic programs, um, speech and language services. Um, there's, there's not a lot of licensed candidates and we've had to hire people at M9 or M10 for those positions because there's only one or two candidates out there. So five years is the average based on our hiring trends um, of what we typically see. So we estimate M5. Sometimes I have to go higher than that because that's the only candidate I have or they're the best candidate. Sometimes we're able to bring somebody in at Masters One. You know, so that's just an average. And then maintenance. Again, plumbing repair, electric repairs. We base that on trend data. 
Uh, we look at what our past spends have been. We estimate uh, uh, what the cost will be. Sometimes we, I mean, we had a year where every other day we were fixing the boiler at each olive day. And, you know, it's a 25-year-old school. Some years we exceed that line. Some years we come in under budget. So those are the areas that we um, sometimes see unexpected savings in. Just, I want to, for the public, a breakdown of our budget. 86% of the school department budget is dedicated to salaries. Those are fixed costs based on the collective bargaining agreement. 8% of our budget is dedicated to services. So as you probably know, we contract out transportation. That's a huge budget driver. I think it's about 600000 um, for our transportation contract. So 8% of our budget goes to fixed costs for, for um, transportation and other contracts. We only spend 2% of our budget on out-of-district tuitions. That's significantly lower than many, many districts you'll see. Um, we keep our students in-house. It's cost-effective, and it's the best educationally for those students. Um, and then we have 1% that's dedicated to other fixed expenses, like in the teacher contract, when people retire, they have the right to buy back some of their sick time. Um, so we have other um, contractual requirements that's 1% of the budget. We only have 3% of our total budget dedicated to supplies. Um, just again for the community's background, um, our per pupil, the Department of Education publishes annually per pupil costs for every district in the Commonwealth. Um, we have been under about a thousand dollars under the average per pupil spending for the state. So, and that includes urban communities, every community. The average um, per people cost of education is 16000 for the state. In 2017, we were uh, $1,000 under at close to $15,000. we are actually even more disparate from the state um, last year because we had a typical increase, but we have a larger student body um, that we're dividing that. You're dividing the total budget by. Um, there are 10 districts that the State um, Department of Education has identified as comparison communities for us, for Norfolk based on demographics, but also based on structure. So these are all elementary districts. Um, the cost to educate students in, in districts that have a high school are slightly higher. You have coaching, you have athletics, you have a lot of other programs. So these are districts that are only elementary districts. You can see that um, Norfolk is the lowest, um, second to lowest in terms of per pupil expenditure um, of all the comparison communities. Rentham and Plainville spend significantly more um, than we are able to spend to educate students. The only district that spends less per pupil is Berkeley in our comparison group. Um, even though we, I, I would say we have a very fiscal um, conservative, a fiscally conservative approach to bud budgeting, we do have a high return on our investment. Um, Norfolk students are in the top 18 percent of the state MCAS test. Our current class sizes they used to be on the lower end. They're average now compared to those comparison communities um, because they've increased over the past five years due to enrollment growth. We still have outstanding arts education programs, music, visual arts, chorus, uh, band program. We have physical and health education twice a week. The majority of our teachers have advanced degrees and at least 10 years teaching experience, and we have a very low turnover of staff. Um, again, we're blessed to have very clean, modern, um, appropriate educational spaces. Um, again, our understanding was that we were asked to, to share with you what it would look like if we were in, in different budget scenarios for um, a zero increase or 3%. <coughs> so in order to do that, we had to take a look at what all of our known costs are to date. And again, this, uh, these are really fixed costs, but some of them could, um, because some of them could change. So we know fixed costs. We have 173578 um, just for steps and lane changes for, for current staff. That doesn't include any COLA for teachers because we haven't even started negotiating the successor teacher contract. So just steps and lanes are 173 We do estimate a 2% COLA for our non-union staff. Um, I don't know if somebody's ringing. Um, the bus, the th we're in the third year of our current bus contract. The increase for next year of the contract is 15000 Again, we are anticipating, based on enrollment projections that NESDEC put forward with us and the new development, that we're going to need an additional session of kindergarten for next year. We opened kindergarten enrollment early this year. It started Jan uh, whatever yesterday was, yesterday. Um, we have 84 students enrolled currently. We try to keep our kindergarten class sizes between 18 and 21 per the school committee policy. 
Um, we will track that enrollment. If it doesn't turn out that we see the enrollment we're projecting, then that would come off. We wouldn't need an additional kindergarten teacher or an additional assistant. We're watching that closely. We'll have a better <coughs> sense of that by the end of January. We are projecting that we're going to need to add a special education teacher. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we save money annually by educating all of our kids to the best of our ability within the district and not outplacing students. We have a program at the H. Olive Day Lower Elementary School. It's a substantially separate program for students on the autism spectrum or with significant cognitive and medical challenges. Um, most of the students in that program are educated in a dis discrete trial format, one-to-one -one intense um, educational programming. We have students in that program that will be aging out of it and moving up to Freeman Kennedy. We do not have a parallel receiving program. So we're going to have to build a program or we're going to end up having to outplace students. Um, so that's in there for 64000 Again, that's the budget estimate of M5. Um, we would also need to increase our occupational therapist um, at the Freeman Kennedy in order to pick up the related service needs of the students that would be moving up. And that's only by point one, so that's a half a day. We have some current litigation that we are expecting that we are going to need to increase the special education legal line by 10000 Our expense budget we're projecting would be increasing by 20000 and the majority of that would be to outfit and furnish another kindergarten classroom, so about $9,000 for furniture and all the curriculum materials, textbooks, um, equipment for that kindergarten class. The other is on the maintenance side. Um, we're seeing some increased costs there. And then we do, we always back out any savings we know we're going to see. So right now we have one known retirement. We've deducted that from um, our fixed costs. So right now we're at 3.5% um, of what we would need to level, uh, to move the district forward with a level service budget. But again, that does not include any increased um, COLA for teachers at this point. If we negotiate for every 1% increase, we know the cost is going to be about $80,000. Um, so in a level budget scenario, a zero increase, um, we would need to reduce our budget by between $569,000 and $609,000 based on those fixed cost estimates and an estimate of a 1.5 to 2% COLA for teachers. Again, we haven't started negotiations. It could come in lower that than that. It could come in higher than that. So I had to put, in order to provide you what you had asked for, an estimate of that cost. For us, um, that would be nine to ten positions. Um, we just, you can't, like I said, only 3% of our budget supplies. I can't, there's, there'd be no way that we could create that kind of savings in a supply account. Um, what that would mean for us would be we would have to reduce, um, we'd have to increase class sizes first. Uh, we would reduce four teaching positions. We would be at our maximum class size uh, limit in K-2 to and approaching that in grades three to six. We would look at in reducing instructional support services, so that would be developmental math, reading, and a .5 school psychologist, um, and that would just reduce the frequency and types of services we could provide to students. Um, we have a technology integration program, and that really looks at science and STEM and engineering, and we infuse that into the classroom. Um, we would have to eliminate the technology integration teachers, um, one physical education teacher, and a .5 band to get to that nine to 10 positions. And again, if we don't see kindergarten enrollment, that would look different because we'd be taking 100000 off the top of the request. Um, a 3% increase would mean that we would see an additional revenue of about 382000 uh, We would still need to cut between 186 to, and 226 depending on how ne teacher negotiations go and what the kindergarten enrollment looks like. Um, typically, it takes us about 3% to move forward current staff with steps and lane changes. Um, that varies a little bit depending, sometimes, like I said, depending on enrollment, whether we need all the positions to move forward. Um, last year, we did ha it doesn't give us the capacity to do, absorb the new growth. Um, there's a lot of development happening across the town. So last year, we added two teachers to Freeman Kennedy School. Um, this year, we'll need an additional kindergarten um, teacher and assistant. We're projecting. Um, so that would mean, again, if we have to close the gap by 150 to 200, um, about three to four positions. Again, it's early in the budget process. That picture could change depending on how some of the other variables um, end up. Um, budget variables, we move forward K enrollment so that we would have an estimate of that cost early. Um, we 
are um, in the process of opening negotiations with the teachers. We have scheduled um, negotiation meetings for January and February. So hopefully once that's resolved, we'll have actual numbers to put in place. Um, we will com continue to work closely throughout the process with the town. We're happy to come on a Saturday and provide any additional information you're looking for. Um, our goal is to bring forward a fiscally responsible and conservative budget that allows us to continue to provide the same level of services and educational quality to um, the students and residents. That's the overview. I'm happy to answer questions you may have or again the board or Todd if, uh, if I can't answer a question I'm sure they can. So. Well first off thank you so much for putting this together. I mean, this is incredibly valuable to get some more insight and understanding into the process that you take to be able to get to the point you are. So thank you very much to you and the committee as well for putting this all together. Um, does anybody have any questions of clarification or anything of that nature with the understanding that we're going to be doing a much more deeper dive into the actual numbers once we have something more solid during our budget reviews? I think I'd rather wait until we have mm -hmm. a, a deeper, you know, since these numbers are so... They're preliminary. Yeah. Preliminary. I don't want to be drilling down too much and then, you know, I'm lazy. I have to do it again. Yeah, yeah, no, understood. Chris? Nope, I think it's great that they do a zero-based budget. It's going to, since it's the largest piece of our budget, I think it's going to make it real, real easy. Absolutely. We'll be able to dig deep into it. Absolutely. So that's great. Thank you so much again. You're very welcome. And Paul um, is, is next. You don't need my, you have your own laptop. And again, I just want to clarify that we do work closely together. Um, the budget timeline is different for KP. They have a lot more variables than we have. So, yeah. um, you know, it looks a little different. Absolutely. Thank you again, Dr. Lowry. So I invited um, Mr. Azer up here, our business manager, because if you were around last year, you saw that it was the Paul and Larry show, <laughs> uh, much like Abbott and Costello. We were out sometimes two and three shows a night um, doing all three towns. And so um, we, we do this work together. And so we wanted to basically just you know, share with you briefly. Um, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be here this evening and to let you know that we're at a, a little bit different place than, than Norfolk is at this point because of the timelines that go into the regional piece of it. Right. And so when, when Blythe was, was chatting with us, she recognized that that was the case and simply asked us the very basic questions. And so that's why you have kind of a different presentation or, or basically more of a memo from us sure. at this point. Um, I want to begin by also saying that uh, like Dr. Alati said, we work very, very closely with the elementary districts, and um, I, I was pleased, you know, with uh, how Ingrid was describing the way that, that we share resources, we work together. We've also written a grant, the four superintendents together, for social emotional learning that um, has brought in over $300,000 to the, the communities um, that, that we're, we're playing out this year as well. Um, that said, um, what Dr. Alati described to you as far as the process, I think is very similar for us with a little bit of an addition. Because of the way middle schools and high schools are set up, there are more conversations that go into the budget because of the people that have to be brought into those conversations. So for us, uh, the fall is spent um, with budget. Mm -hmm. It's a budget all the time. We start actually in August, September, but by October, November, we're sitting down with each department, and that's when we spend a whole day at the high school, we spend a whole day at the middle school, and each department head comes in and they talk about the specific needs that, are, that go along with their departments as well. And so where Dr. Alati talked about class sizes and looking at projections, while that's very important for us as well, we have a, a difficult piece in that because students make choices by the time they get to high school, the, the class sizes vary greatly depending on whether it's an AP class versus it's a standard class um, and which classes are required for them for four years for graduation versus which ones are electives which are, are, and which ones are building their, their portfolio toward their college mm -hmm. acceptances and what we have to offer for them. So it gets much more complex when we have to look at how we staff and what we're staffing. And so that's all part of that conversation that occurs during the fall. There are many things that are very similar to with our budget that is uh, with the Norfolk budget around, for example, the amount of discretionary funding that we have. Like Norfolk, maybe three to four percent of our budget is around consumables and materials such as textbooks and, and things of that nature. The rest of that uh, of our budget is really assigned to things like staffing. Um, what's different for us is that we are, in fact, our own municipality. So <laughs> where the, uh, the elementary school system is able to 
pair off with the town for example things like health insurance we're responsible for building those things into our budget as well and so you're going to see when we when we kind of break out the figures in just a minute that that has a tremendous impact on our budget so roughly 15 percent of our budget is, is health um, insurance this year larry was able to meet with our providers back in the fall and get some estimates and while the last couple of years we've done fairly well and our percentage of increase has come in right around the percentage of increase for our overall budget, roughly 3%, this year they're projecting somewhere between 10 and 15%. So at this point in the budget process, we have to put those estimates in. So we're building in around 12% at this point. We'll be continuing to meet with them and get final figures, and as those figures change, we will change our budget accordingly to reflect that. But when you're looking at a 12% increase, 15% um, of your budget, you're talking about an overall 2% increase to our budget right off the top. There's no way around that. So when we talk about a level service budget or a level funded budget, just to continue um, with the same services as last year, we need 2% more than what we received last health insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, So that's one thing I wanted to highlight, and Larry will break that out into, into more detail. The other thing that I wanted to kind of jump in and, and mention, um, as Dr. Alati talked about special education costs. And so we know that in 1975, federal law was passed that, that provided um, a protections for students who had not previously been provided for an education. 94-142, public law 94-142 created um, federal legislation that said that students with disabilities are entitled to a free, appropriate public education. Uh, that tenet still stands today. It's the only law that talks about a particular group of students having a right to an education, and it does specifically define that. When they talk about public education, that means that it's the public school's responsibility to provide that. Free means regardless of the cost. So those variables are always something that we have to work with within our budget. Now, what you, those of you who are in the audience will probably remember is that Larry and I are, are fairly new to the districts. Larry's been here just a little bit longer than myself, but when we came in, one of our charges was to really look at the budget very carefully. I was fortunate that as I arrived, I was able to also hire a new special ed director. So having been a special education director for 12 years myself, hiring a new special education director, one of the areas that we looked at was the special education costs involved. It had been an area that had been questioned, and rightly so, in the past. I mentioned free appropriate public education to you, but one of the other principles of the law is also least restrictive environment, which Dr. Aladi also alluded to. Whenever we're looking at uh, providing services for a student, we're always trying to provide them in the environment that's closest to the non-disabled peers. We want to see them in their neighborhood schools, in the regular classroom wherever possible. And in fact, at least 80% of our students can be provided services within the regular classroom if we build in the right supports for them. The majority of the remaining 20% can still be educated within the same public school, but they sometimes require more intense programming to make the, that education work for them. And then there are a few students that either because of the intensity of the program or the lack of a cohort involved require services outside of the public school setting, and that's when we would look at tuitions. What I will share with you is that when I came on board, we were looking at a roughly 59 students that were receiving services outside of the King Philip District. We were paying tuition for those 59 students. Tuitions varied, um, the services varied, but that was the number of students that were receiving out of district placements, and we had a tuition cost for them. We have been working to build programs internally so that two things. One, the district is, you know, is running a more cost-effective budget, but more importantly, coming back to that tenant that I believe so passionately, the least restrictive environment means keeping those students in the schools with their peers. We can't do that without the appropriate supports. But I am pleased to tell you that um, right now, our numbers of out-of-district placements are in the 40s. And if we continue with the trajectory that we're expecting, students will be aging out, graduating, and we're looking at the low 30s by the end of next school year. What we also know is that we have students coming up from the elementaries that are requiring extensive supports. We have students in our schools that require extensive supports. So to keep those students in-house, we have to build programming. Dr. Alati alluded to it as her students were moving up from the um, Olive Day to Kennedy Freeman. We're in the same situation. So what you're going to see in the report, and, and we're going to get into this in much more detail when we do our full budget report yep. to everybody, but 
what we have been doing is reducing our costs within special education, but also then reinvesting some of those to build the internal programming and supports to keep those students in their school environment. And so Larry's going to explain a little bit of that to you because you have the, the chart here. But um, I want to again say our full budget presentation will be presented to the, our school committee on January 27th, and they will be looking at it at that time. It is an open public forum. We invite you all to attend. It's the, the, the beginning of the Larry Paul show. Um, and as I said, last year we, we did it for the advisory committee again. We did it for Plainville. We did it for Rentham. And we would be happy to come back and do it here for you or invite you to come to any of those other presentations that we do. Come to you on the Saturday. Happy to do that and, and answer as many questions <coughs> as you have and go as deeply as you'd like. Uh, we completely believe in transparency. But as I said, last year we were able to reduce our, our, our special education budget by 12% that portion of our budget and this year we're, we're again looking at reductions but you'll see we're looking at reinvesting part of that not all of that and the re uh, additional savings will go to help us balance the budget in other areas mm -hmm. so um, what I would share with you is Larry's put together a couple of, of, of documents that talk about again what would it look like for level service budget um, remembering that again what I said to you about health insurance uh, and some of those other costs and then you know what that would look like for level you know um, level funding, level service, and you know where we are at this point. So I want to turn it over to Larry at this point because I've talked more than enough, as Larry will tell you. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, thanks, Paul. So uh, one change we are going to make to the Larry and Paul show this year is in order to uh, generate some revenue is this is going to be a two-drink minimum for the Larry and Paul show. <laughs> All right. Now you're talking. There you go. Uh, especially this time of night, right? So, um, as uh, as Paul said, we've we're still at the preliminary uh, development of our budget, but um, we have a pretty good idea of uh, what our level service costs are going to be. Um, and to to get right to it, as in the memo, it's it's about 1.6 million dollars just to maintain level services, which is about 4.8 percent of an increase. Um, as Paul indicated, one of the major drivers is health insurance, which is something that's unique to us. Um, we again we we have a 12 percent increase estimate in there the last two years the increase is about two and a half three percent so these things are are cyclical um and um so that's what we're estimating right now we'll have the actual number in about four to five weeks so it'll be in there when we when we vote the final budget at the beginning of march we'll have that actual number and as soon as we get that number in we will um uh, draw that down if if uh required um one of the other major drivers of the um, level service is our utilities. Um, and given the um, uh, climate issues around the, uh, in the area, in the country, and the globe, really, in, in every definition of the word climate, um, predicting the energy market is uh, a tough thing to do. Um, we've uh, tried to, well, we have negotiated contracts to lock in some rates, but they're still at higher rates than they have been, so it's sort of mitigating the uh, increase amount. Um, and we have two very big buildings that are uh, used uh, quite a lot, not only just, you know, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., but our high school is open with activities till 9, 10 o'clock at night. It's open almost, uh, almost every weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, um, both with uh, KP programs, but also with uh, rentals, which we do bring in some money to sort of offset that, but um, those are still cost as well. Um, those are the major d drivers on just what it's taking to uh, just keep doing, keep you know, as you say, keep the doors open, so to speak. Um, Paul already talked about the the savings, uh, the savings on the tuition from kids aging out, um, and what we're looking at is so there's a savings of almost eight hundred thousand dollars on the on the on the students who are going out. But we're looking at repurposing about five hundred thousand dollars of that back into the district to uh, have those in-district programs that Paul talked about. So it's still a net savings of about three hundred thousand um, dollars, and that's the primary thing on the uh, the level service. Um, again, as Paul said, the the um, insurance increase just on itself uh, is about a two percent increase to the entire budget. So having a, a three percent increase doesn't leave hardly any room for anything. Um, but if we were to have just just a three percent increase of the total, um, that would create a gap of roughly six hundred thousand dollars where things stand right now. So again, same sort of math that Dr. Larry talked about, 
that's you know it's the same thing our, our our supply budget is like two to three percent of the budget basically everything else uh that is uh, i guess you could call it discretionary so to speak is staffing and programs so six hundred thousand dollars is roughly 10 to 12 positions and want to make it clear to your you have a different audience than we have at the school committee i said the same thing last night mm-hmm. um because I watched some of those, we Paul and I watched some of those videos that predated us. Um, we don't want there to be panic in the streets. We want p- put your pitchforks back in the in the garage for the time being. We're not saying that there's going to be any staff cuts. We're just talking hypothetically here. We're just having a discussion about what potential impacts would be, and I think you recognize that as well in, in your opening remarks, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, so th- nobody, we're not writing up any pink slips or anything. We have we haven't even looked at that yet. Um, and just to kind of elaborate um, on yeah. what Larry's saying, if in fact we, we are faced with, with a scenario where we do have to cut, again, in, as you know, Dr. Alati described, there aren't a lot of discretionary areas that we can do that. 50% of our budget or over 50% of our budget goes towards staffing and we have those commitments. And there are about 275 staff members that are employed in some capacity through King Philip, whether they're teachers, teacher assistants, secretaries, custodians, cafeteria workers. Um, so you're looking at a large number of staff members. We would, at that point, you know, when we knew that cuts had to be made, or if we knew that cuts had to be made, we would be very uh, thoughtful about where that would happen, meeting with all of our department heads, meeting with our building administrators, looking at cost enrollments of, of what students are selecting, and all of those pieces, and putting that all together to try to find a way to um, soften the blow, if you will, to, to see the least harm done. Um, it's we are working very hard to build the strongest program possible for your students and when you see our overall presentation you're going to see that the very strong foundation that Norfolk Elementary builds uh, gets continued into the high school and we have incredibly proud stories to tell you about the the graduates that are coming out of, uh, of our schools and it's because of the education that we provide and like Dr. Alati alluded to when she talked about the amount of uh, the per pupil allocation our per pupil allocation at King Philip is dramatically <coughs> less than what other neighboring communities are looking at. And we have that information that we will provide for you as well um, during those presentations. But again, when all is said and done, we recognize that we, what we get is what we get and we have to work through it. But as Dr. Lottie said, and, and similar, we do work from a zero base as well, building our way up and looking item by item, department by department, um, and are very thoughtful some departments go up, some departments go down, and we do that to, to try to do the best we can to balance the budget. That being said, that's as far as we would go at this point. Um, we're very happy to be meeting with you as many times as necessary for you to feel very comfortable with the budget uh, and to have all of your questions answered. If you have any this evening, we're very happy to answer them for you right now. Um, I don't have any from my end. Nope. Susie, Chris? Nope. Also. Thank you very much, Ellen. Really appreciate it. Yep. Our pleasure. Thank you. So we discussed some parameters. We can. We did. Um, we, we have an outline. We have a structure. Uh, we appreciate the informative session given by the two schools um, or the two school groups. Um, I think that's going to create a solid foundation for our own research leading up to the full budget reviews. And you know, should we come up with any kind of extra questions or things that we think would benefit from being clarified in greater detail, we'll pass those along and ensure that we have them ready for that session. Sure. Great. Um, that being said, do we want to solidify a date for our review? Yes, please. Any objections to solidifying a date for our, nope. uh, our budget review? Nope. <clears throat> now, it was originally proposed that we leverage a Saturday, um, not only so that we'd be able to use the largest allotment of time, but also so that we'd be able to free up our Tuesday meetings to be able to accommodate for the flurry of other very important things that we discuss. Um, does anybody have an objection to leveraging a weekend afternoon uh, for an extended period of time to be able to capture as much as possible? Nope. Nope? nope. Okay. That being said, Blythe, when can we be ready to execute something like this, the earliest possible right. time? So um, the last page in that section of the book was um, my first draft of a schedule. Um, 
we receive we're, we're going to receiving all the town side budgets by this Thursday and I have Todd and I have all of our meetings with departments all next week um, and then leaving ourselves the week of the 20th and maybe a little bit into the following week to put together this budget document for you um, we've never really had one before so it's a it's quite a work in progress I would think that we would be to give you time to actually review it I wouldn't want to start before the 8th um, are you talking February then? February 8th um, I know there's school vacation there somewhere I, I'm not don't have kids in school so I'm not sure exactly which date week that is I think it's the 17th yeah um, so I don't know if anyone's away for that um, we are yeah. so I I would say if you're trying to do it earlier in the month we could target the 8th I haven't asked starting with you I don't I assume all department heads can make it but I'll have to find that out Um, okay, so CC, you'll be gone starting the 15th. So if we were, I mean, in potentially the 22nd as well. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's up in the air exactly, but yeah, it's that, that's February vacation week. So it's entirely possible that it's 15th to the 22nd or the. I know it probably, it, it probably goes without saying, but yes. the emphasis should be on February 8th. I'm just checking with the finance director in the back of the room whether February 8th worked for him too. Yes, Thomas, we want to know if you can be here on the 8th. <laughs> the, guy, the guy in the blue shirt. I can do it. <laughs> I think the, the, the emphasis should really be put on the confidence that we'll be able to get you know full outlines, all questions asked, everybody fully prepared. Because yep. the worst thing that can happen is that we schedule this budget review and a question comes up and it's uh, we'll have to do a little bit more to get a back. Hair appointment. What's that? I'm going to be moving a hair appointment. All right, check that. That's not the most important thing. The hair appointment is okay. the most important I'm thing. I'm happy this is to do it. I'm going to have to deal with. So that all being said, given the timeline you have yep. outlined, you're, you have full confidence yep. that we'd be able to have a productive, fruitful, and yes. ultimately, yes. potentially finalized review session scheduled. Okay. Chris, I'm available. All right. 24-7. All right. So we will tentatively schedule the 8th as our budget review day. Um, I would recommend that we start relatively early in the afternoon. Okay. Afternoon? Just, yep. Yep. We can do all day with snacks. Catered lunch. Paid for by individuals. I had reached out already to uh, Norfolk Cable. Um, I just need to check with her about getting okay. someone, but she thought with enough advance warning she'd be able to. Okay. So I, I would imagine I would, you know, throw out there a 10 a.m. start, and then. Oh, instead of you said afternoon. Early afternoon. We have different levels of afternoon with four-year-olds that wake me up at that's five. A morning, but okay. So 10 or, or 1. I, I'm I, I would prefer that we go before lunch. I'm, for the oh, okay. I'll do, I'm blocking out the whole day starting at 10. If people need to move it around, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm, block, I'm just blocking the whole day. And the other question I, I have to make sure that we have all the right people there is, do you want every department head? Um, do you want to leave it a little bit to our discretion? For instance, there isn't really a department head for the weights and measures budget or the celebrations budget, those very small ones. I, I would think we definitely want police, fire, public works, council on aging, finance, building, town clerk, library. Um, but maybe there's some smaller ones that we, there's gonna be a value to having somebody come out for. Um, we can put a schedule together and just have you look at it ahead of time, make sure you're comfortable with it. I would be inclined to leave that to your discretion to okay. represent smaller departments if needed. I don't know what the board's feelings are. I would agree. Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. I'm thinking if there's value in segmenting the day to include windows for individual departments, but that'll be difficult to do not knowing how long a single department could be. At the same point, I don't want to have a group of people we'll waiting outside for the end. entire afternoon or early. I think we can put together a schedule with the big, the larger departments. The public safety departments are going to take more time, yep. and, and, and public works. 
than um, than the um, HR department or the town clerk. Some of it's very straightforward. You know, there's one or two people in a department, and you know, if just for town clerk, for example, there are three elections rather than one. Right. That's not something we can decide we're not going to do. Right. So you know, some of it's f- a little easier to work through than how we go about doing some of the things we do, how we staff in, say, police. Yep. Okay, so, I mean, we provided you a date and a start time. Yep. I imagine you'll fill it in from there. We will. <laughs> yep. And get back to us on what that looks like in terms of the day. Okay. Um, I wouldn't necessarily throw an end time on there, but I will not be bringing a sleeping bag. You are no fun. <laughs> Do we have anything else to discuss as it relates to our uh, budgetary plan for this no, year? No, we do not. Nope. 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 Yes, sir. One date. Should we throw in a backup date is the I question? You're going to have 20 some people here. People might have a vacation planned or an event planned like their daughter's gymnastics tournament. So it might not really be easy to switch. So I'd like to see if you could possibly have at least two dates. We'll stick with the state. If we get feedback from people that they have something that cannot be moved and it's the board's inclination that we require them there for that review, then we can look at an alternative at that point. For right. that. Thank you. For those people, yeah. For those people. Yeah. Right. Or hopefully if we're going to be spending enough time at that day, there's a better time for some people and, right. you know, that we can accommodate. Right. Or they can fly back from Florida for five hours. Right. One of the that's two. That's totally. No. Or they could send one of us to Florida instead and they can <laughs> stay here. And that's another option. Another way you can do it. I'm here to help. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That moves us on to our warrants this evening. Oh, oh no, I'm not first. Chris is first. Mr. Weeder. Weeder. I move the board approve the following warrant, 12-17-2019, the amount of $193,351.26. Seconded. I, I mean, you could just run through all those that are yours so we don't have to keep bouncing back and forth. Okay. I move the board approve the following warrant on 12 20 2019, the amount of $913,801.43. Move the board approve the following warrant of 12 24 2019, the amount of $610,640.89. Now I'm seconding it. Any further discussion? No. Nope. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, I move that the board approve the following warrant. December 17th, 2019, $123,018.87. Second. Hear a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 And I move that the board approve the following warrant dated 12-31-2019 in the amount of $750, dated 12-31-2019 in the amount of $94,044.14, and dated 12-31-2019 in the amount of $26,123.36. Second. Hearing a second. Any further discussion? No. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. No minutes this evening? One. One One minute. Beach. All right, so I did. I reviewed this one. I didn't see any typos. <laughs> we'll find out. Um, I moved to the board approve the minutes of the December 10th, 2019 regular meeting. Second. Here's a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Very good. Blythe, do we have anything else this evening? Good, Chris. Uh, how'd you make out with looking at the lights for the or lights for around the police for identifying the police station? Remember, you're going to check into that over on Sharon Ave. Remember at the street at one A. Yeah, at the at the um, at one at one A, and whether there's a light. Well, there is no light, but yes. whether or not to make it so that they visible more. I have visible. a meeting with the chief on Thursday, so I need to take it up then. Easy. Anything to add? No. Very good. Anything else from the audience? Seeing nothing. That being said, I move that the board adjourn for the evening. Seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Have a great evening. Thank you. I already signed the warrant.